Ivan the Terrible, the 16th century Grand Prince of Moscow and the first czar of what would go on to become the Russian Empire. His terrible nickname actually does not come from any atrocities he committed, but rather from a poor translation. Terrible comes from a mistranslation of the word Grozny, which more closely translates to inspiring fear or terror, threatening, even awesome, rather than terrible as in something or someone being extremely bad or unpleasant. All that being said, he truly was terrible, like really, really terrible. At various times when he felt that his power was being threatened or if he wanted to send a strong message to not be defied, he had men, women, and children killed in mass in the most terrible of ways. Men, women, and children who were his own people. On a few occasions, he had his minions, the Aprichniki, referred to aptly in one source as the children of darkness, decimate most of an entire town in cruelly imaginative ways. These also very terrible men under his command carried out state-sanctioned mass rapes, horrific straight-out-of-the-Saw movie franchise torture sessions, and public executions. Most of Ivan's violence was directed at Muscovy's nobility, the boyars. Ivan hated Muscovy aristocracy for reasons we'll explain soon, and he liked his people to know that no one was safe from his wrath. Money and land would not spare you from having your wife raped or your skin removed from your body. And why do I keep saying Muscovy? Are we talking about Russia? Yes, one and the same. Like basically all of Europe, Russia is a land that's been called more than a few names over the years. Muscovy was the common term for the Grand Duchy of Moscow, a Rus, a.k.a. East Slavic Finnic principality centered around Moscow, a vassal state to the Mongol Empire created in 1283 CE. And then Ivan expanded this vassal state in 1547 by taking the title of Tsar and Grand Duke Rus, turning the Grand Duchy of Moscow into the Tsardom of Russia and waging some wars against the Mongols and others to expand and solidify his turf. And then the land would be renamed the Russian Empire by future Tsar Peter the Great in 1721, who expanded it further. Then it would officially become part of the Soviet Union in 1922. Then it became Russia in 1991. So when I say Muscovy, think Russia. Going to cover some Russian history today as well. Despite all of his violent ways, Ivan would be revered by many future Russians, especially future communist leader Joseph Stalin. Why? The really short answer is because he made Russia strong. Ivan was a sadistic psychopath, but he would be also heralded for uniting the nation of Muscovy in a way it had never been united before. The people of the lands of Muscovy hadn't lived in a nation to be reckoned with for centuries. Not since they were part of the loose federation of East Slavic and Finnic peoples known as Kievan Rus. Uh, the Federation Russia would derive its name from that had fallen to Muslim invaders in the early 13th century and become a vassal state, a nation that pays another nation a bunch of money every year not to have the shit kicked out of it. Ivan expanded and secured the borders of Muscovy during his lifetime, and a long period of Eastern Siberian expansion began during his rule. He also set the precedent for strong authoritarian royal rule in Russia that would last with minor interruptions until the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Before Ivan, Muscovy was a weak land, a landlocked Eastern European Orthodox Christian country sandwiched between stronger Muslim and Catholic nations, and Ivan would make Muscovy a nation to be reckoned with, a nation to be feared. He would make Russia strong and set it on a path to becoming a world power. But this bump in status would come at a price. Ivan's reign would be reminiscent of the reign of other infamous men we've talked about on Time Suck, like 15th century Wallachia's Vlad the Impaler. Like Vlad, Ivan was ruthless. Also like Vlad, somewhat a product of his time. He was born into an especially bloody era of history, and he witnessed more torture and killing and evil plotting and scheming growing up than I'm guessing anyone listening to this podcast today can relate to in any meaningful way. Ivan was born into a world of seemingly constant bloodshed. 16th century Muscovy wasn't just flowers and holding hands and dressing puppies in doll clothes and eating cookies before Ivan came along and started burning people alive and having women raped in the streets. No. That being said, Ivan was so violent, he stood out for being a murderous tyrant in an age full of murderous tyrants. Ivan IV was a mean bastard who oversaw huge conquests of neighboring lands, the creation of a true Russian national church, the formation of a standing army, and Russia's emergence as a world power. And I'm excited to share what we put together regarding this terrible dude here today on another dark, historical, and very Russian edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. 
It's time for Yamo Time Suck. Whoa, 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 Yamo Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, love you, Lucifina. You're a good boy, Bojangles. And hope you're in the recording studio right now, Triple M. I'm Dan Cummins, a boomer who is so extra. Obsessor over all things Russian. Polish exterminator. JK, oh my heck. A pony play supply peddler. And you are listening to Time Suck. Thanks again for the continued ratings and reviews. I, I see them. I can't help but look. And they motivate me and the team here to, uh, you know, help us help us uh, improve things. Those, those reviews and ratings also help us find new sacks to bring into the fold of the dark, weird, little curious cult we built here. Uh, thank you again to the Space Lizards who support this show on Patreon and have allowed us to donate $5,400 to the Pen Fed Foundation this month. Pen Fed Foundation for Military Heroes helps veterans buy homes, go back to school, pay their bills, and so much more. Hail Nimrod. Go to penfedfoundation.org to find out more. Link in the episode description. I uh, got a new Time Suck baseball tee in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Let's, let's wear ball. I mean, if we can't play ball, you know, at least we can wear it and, you know, and make this summer feel a little more normal, right? Got several different options. Team Time Suck, Team Meat Sack. Even Ed Kemper's playing a little, little ball because he likes to swing a stick, mother. Okay. All that being said, uh, now it's time to go back to Russia. Let's get to the life. Bloody times of a dude. Our, our Patreon space lizards have been voting up for well over a year, attempting to make him a Monday topic. I've been voting into the top five topics on our bi-monthly topic voting rounds about uh, 30 fucking times. Not even kidding. Not, not exaggerating. And I'm glad we finally get to suck him. I can't stop, uh, you know, I can stop wondering if he's going to win or not. Uh, Ivan, the terrible story is a crazy one. It was fun to suck it. Let's get to it. A lot, of, a lot of info to go over as usual. So here's, here's how we're going to lay this bad boy out today. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the czars that came after Ivan, you know, from the position he created. Ivan IV was the very first Russian leader to be officially a czar, a title similar to that of a Roman emperor or Byzantine emperor. Uh, Ivan's grandfather, Ivan the Great, also called himself czar in communications, but it was, it was never official. His grandpa didn't rule with the Russian church's blessing as a supreme leader, far more powerful than the nobility around him. After seeing what came after Ivan, we'll look at what came before him, a more than two-century period of the Mongol rule of what is now Russian land by members of the Golden Horde, a.k.a. the Great State. We'll examine the rise of the Russian Orthodox Church that Ivan would align himself with and be anointed by. Without this church, there would be no czars. We'll also look at the boyars, Russia's nobles. Vlad the Impaler rose to power and bloody infamy, partially by purging many of Valakia's boyer nobles and keeping the rest afraid of him, and Ivan would do the same thing in Muscovy. Tales of Vlad the Impaler began showing up in Muscovy in the late 15th century, decades before Ivan's birth, and Ivan is said to have found and loved these tales. He was inspired by Vlad, loved him, idolized him, modeled the way he took power, you know, and, and, and held it, M modeled his, uh, you know, his, his barbaric, intimidating methods. I like this Vlad guy. I like how he put many people on sticks and kill much rich people, take money and land, some for self, some for murder thug, loyal to him. Vlad have no fucks to give. I like. <laughs> no line he not cross. I, I like. He gets so much what he wants through much fear. I like. I just read a book by Italian guy, Machiavelli. He say, it is better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. <laughs> Vlad would get that. I like it. He and me, we no care about love. We care about fear. After getting a feel for, uh, you know, who the nobles were that Ivan terrorized, we'll, we'll dig into some examples of Ivan's most famous atrocities before jumping into today's, into, into today's timeline that will lead us through the history of Russia, evolving from a collection of Slavic tribes to a military force to be reckoned with. Doing that will also walk us through the major dates of Ivan's life, which, have, you know, we will cover, of course, from birth to death. A look at his life will include more examples of horrible atrocities uh, that we won't get into in the preview before the timeline. So does this, does this awfulness sound kind of fun? I mean, maybe interesting is the better word. I hope it sounds interesting. Uh, let's start and take a peek at the legacy that Ivan the Terrible, Ivan IV, first true czar of Russia, started by listing off some of the most famous czars that came after him, starting with Boris Godunov. Uh, Boris Godunov. <laughs> ah, oh, man, his last name's fucking it's tough. Boris. Boris is good enough. Boris, G-O-D-U-N-O-V, Gadunov. Such a great classic Russian name. Boris was one of Ivan's children of darkness, one of the most one of these professional torturers and rapists known as the Oprichniki. 
Boris had married the daughter of the head of the Oprichniki, an especially ruthless dude, Malyuta Skuratov. To make a quick Star Wars analogy, if Ivan the Terrible was the evil emperor, Melyuta was his Darth Vader. That motherfucker was in charge of carrying out a number of the most terrible things that Ivan ordered to be done. And Tsar Boris was Darth Vader's son-in-law, which would kind of make him Han Solo, I guess. Now the analogy no longer works because he didn't have a Wookiee co-pilot and he didn't have a good heart under his, uh, you know, uh, facade of I only care about me. Boris became co-regent in 1584 following Ivan's death, appointed by Ivan on his deathbed to keep shit from crumbling into chaos until Ivan's son, Fyodor I, was ready to rule. Boris would seize the throne in 1598 following the death of Fyodor. So he'd be regent for a while. Then he'd take a break. Then he'd be back to actually be a czar. And during Boris's seven-year rule, he did do some nice things, like allow young Russian nobles to seek their education outside of Russia and Europe. He imported teachers into his empire. He, he cozied up to the kingdoms of Scandinavia, pursuing peaceful access to the Baltic Sea. And he also did some not-so-nice things. Boris made it illegal for Russian peasants to transfer their allegiance from one noble to another, thus cementing in place a key component of serfdom that would lead to an enormous peasant class of slave laborers tied to the land they worked on, people whose descendants would eventually rise up and overthrow their royal masters in 1917. After Boris' death, Russia entered the time of troubles, which included famine, many civil wars between opposing boyer factions, and open meddling in Russian affairs by the nearby kingdoms of Poland and Sweden. Life for the average citizen would actually become worse during the time of troubles than it was during the reign of Ivan the Terrible, which is saying a lot. It's going to be hard to believe by the end of this gory suck. Boris's reign would last until 1605. Eight years later, Tsar Michael I would rule. Michael I, mostly known for being really, really good at basketball. Motherfucker could dunk from the foul line all day. Huge hops. Uh, primarily played shooting guard, but had an otherworldly all-around game. Even solid low down on the post, especially late in his career when his knees started to go and he had to rely more on kind of upper body strength in his mental game. And of course, I'm talking about a different Michael now. Uh, everyone else is talking about Jordan, and it felt right to throw it in. Michael I, mostly known for being the first Romanov czar. He kicked off three centuries of one family ruling Russia. It's a sign of how shitty life was in Russia during and shortly after the time of troubles. Michael had to wait weeks before a suitably intact palace could be located for him in Moscow to lead from because uh, much of the city lay in ruin, just disarray. Michael would lead for over 30 years until 1645, and he negotiated a long period of peace with fierce neighbors Sweden and Poland. Yes, it's true. At various points in history, Russia was afraid of both Poland and Sweden. Not true right now. I'm uh, pretty sure Vladimir Putin has never said, no, we cannot. We might anger Sweden. That would be the end of us. He's probably never said something like, well, what would Poland think? We cannot risk incurring Poland's wrath. Time change. Uh, next czar, almost 40 years after Michael I's death, one of Russia's most famous czars, Peter the Great, would rule from 1682 all the way to 1725. Peter was Michael's grandson. He's best known for his ruthless attempts to further westernize Russia and import the principles of the Enlightenment into what the rest of Europe still considered a backward and medieval country. He arranged the Russian military and bureaucracy along western lines and required his officials to shave their long traditional beards. That was a big deal. Getting rid of their... Big, long Russian beards they'd had for centuries and dress in Western clothes. Dude was an imposing leader. He was 6'8", 6 feet 8 inches tall during a day and age when the average European man's height was just under 5'6". <laughs> he, was, he was a good 15 inches taller than the average uh, dude. The average height for a guy now is 5'9". Is having Peter the Great for a leader would, would, would be like having uh, Shaquille O'Neal for a leader right now. I can only imagine him having meetings with other European leaders like uh, King George of England. He was, you know, he was tall, above average. He was 5'11". King Louis uh, you know, of, of the 16th of France, he was, he was 5'6". wonder if Peter tried to get into their heads at all, you know, when they maybe showed up for some meetings. Hello, little fellas. Hey, little guys. Ah, uh, would Russell would like to do much more business with your tiny man countries. And I'm like, ruffle their hair. I like you guys. They're so cute. You cute little fellas. Uh, Peter was a lot more than just a tall ass dude. He was a strong military leader who crushed the Swedish army in the Battle of Pol uh, Tava in 1709, a battle that raised the morale of the Russian military and Western eyes, helped his empire secure its claim to the vast Ukraine territory. It would continue to rule off and on for almost three full centuries. Through a number of successful wars, he expanded the Tsardom into a much larger empire than the one he inherited. Also known for founding and developing the Russian capital city of St. Petersburg, which would remain the capital of Russia until 1917. 16 years. After the end of his reign and many rulers later, uh, his daughter Elizabeth would become Tsar, Tsar, Tsarista, 
aka Empress of Russia. Elizabeth of Russia seized power in 1741 in a bloodless coup. She went on to distinguish herself as the only Russian ruler never to execute even a single subject during her reign. She was like the anti-Ivan the Terrible. Bummer for storytelling purposes, her nickname wasn't Elizabeth the Not-Too-Bad or Elizabeth the Not-So-Terrible or Elizabeth Pretty Good. Elizabeth the Could Be Worse, you know? During her 20 years on the throne, Russian blood would be shed. However, as Russia became entangled in two major conflicts, the Seven Years' War and the War of Austrian Secession. Always war. Always war going on over here. Uh, Elizabeth is perhaps best known for establishing the University of Moscow and spending vast sums of money on various palaces. She liked a fancy palace. She liked shiny things. And some starving peasants didn't think it was super cool that she was remodeling another palace or building, you know, maybe build a new one while, while they were starving. Weird. What a bunch of whiners. Shut up, Sergey. It's hard to focus on what to hang diamond chandelier. With you constantly asking for small piece of bread. Oh, keep me from dying. Oh, ho, ho. Uh, jokes aside, Elizabeth considered one of the most popular Russian rulers of all time. And within a year of her death, one of the most famous of Russia's czars, or czaristas, would rule Catherine the Great. Between 1762 and 1796, the six-month interval between the death of Elizabeth of Russia and the accession, ascension of Catherine the Great witnessed the six-month reign of Catherine's husband, Peter III, who was likely assassinated. A lot of these people got assassinated. A lot of poisonings going on back then. Catherine was a Prussian princess who had married into the Romanov dynasty. During Catherine's reign, Russia would further expand its borders, absorbing Crimea, partitioning part of Poland, uh, holding off on disparaging Polish jokes, annexing territories along the Black Sea, even settling the Alaskan territory that would later be sold to the U.S. in 1867. A lot of conquests went down on Catherine's watch. I always forget that Russia was the first European power to settle Alaska. Right? The Russians first showed up in Alaska in 1741, founded a colony on Kodiak Island, 1784. Also, as uh, so often happens with strong women rulers, Catherine the Great was the victim of malicious rumors during her lifetime. Some character assassination. Some rumors that have persisted to this day. Although historians agree that she took many lovers throughout her life, the rumor that she died having intercourse with a horse is not true. She was like the original Richard Gere. He never put a gerbil in his ass, and Catherine never fucked horses. Yet the rumors persist. Howdy, partners and ponies. This here's your good buddy, Tom Anderson, a.k.a. Captain Whiskerhorn. Just wanted to point out that Catherine may not have had sex with a real pony, but she may have been into pony play. I would have given her a hell of a deal if she would have ever stopped into Captain Whiskerhorn's pony play emporium, tax shop, and saddlery, your trusted source of sexy bits, bridles, harnesses, halters, hooves, masks, you know, plug tails, and more for the Quad State area for the past 20 years. She would have gotten the royal treatment. Ain't that right, Sasparilla? Sasparilla! Away! Sorry about that, everybody. Jesus Christ. I think Captain, Captain Whiskerhorn is going to be uh, showing up today. Well, it makes a whole hell of a lot more sense for me to pop in than it would be for that no good puppy play peddling rascal Don Doberman showing up. Now, that's enough, Tom! Sorry, new listener. Uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, refocusing now on real Russian history. Ne- next czar. <laughs> Move, moving along. Nicholas I. Another one of Russia's most important rulers was Nicholas I, who took the reins almost 30 years after Catherine's death. One might reasonably uh, claim that the Russian Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, easy Bojangles, I know you get worked up when we talk about the Bolsheviks, uh, had its roots in the reign of Nicholas I. Nicholas was the classic hard-hearted Russian autocrat. He valued the military above all else, ruthlessly repressed dissent in the populace, and in the course of his reign managed to drive the Russian economy into the ground. Nicholas I was also the king of Poland, and the Grand Duke of Finland, through a variety of wars, he expanded Russian territory further. On the eve of his death, the Russian Empire reached its geographical peak, spanning over 20 million square kilometers, 7.7 million square miles. For quick comparison, the U.S., third largest country in the world currently by size, is 3.8 million square miles, or 9.8 million square kilometers. Russia, interestingly, uh, is first with 17.1 million square kilometers, still huge. Still huge. Only went down from 20 million square kilometers to 17.1. Canada's second with 9.9 million square square kilometers. Uh, Nicholas's reign ended in defeat with Russia's failure in the Crimean War of 1853, when the much-vaunted Russian army was unmasked as being poorly disciplined and technically backward. 
Russia also revealed to be weak in other ways via this war. The war revealed to the rest of the world that there were fewer than 600 miles of railroad tracks in this entire gigantic country compared to over 10,000 miles in the U.S., for example. Clearly, Russia still had a long way to go to modernize if it wanted to catch up to other world powers. Two more czars. The first is Alexander II. It's a little known fact, at least in the West, that Russia freed its serfs from the slavery of serfdom around the same time as the U.S. President Abraham Lincoln helped free American slaves. The individual responsible for this was Tsar Alexander II, also known as Alexander the Liberator. Way better moniker than Ivan the Terrible. Alexander also reformed the Russian penal code to make it less harsh towards prisoners. He invested in Russian universities. He sold Alaska to the U.S. in 1867 for $7.2 million. He formally annexed the Kingdom of Poland, which existed as a vassal state of Russia into the Russian Empire. Sounds like he was a pretty good dude. So it only makes sense that he was assassinated in St. Petersburg in 1881. Apparently didn't keep people uh, uh, properly afraid of him. Last on our list of Russian czars is Alexander's grandson, Nicholas II. The last czar of Russia, Nicholas II, witnessed the assassination of his grandfather at the impressionable age of 13. Not the best way to kick off your teen years to see Papa assassinated. Nicholas's reign was mostly defined by a series of disasters. His rule allowed for the strange rise to power and influence of the unhinged former suck subject Rasputin, the wild-eyed, pervy, mad monk who used to convince women that giving him a blowjob was a one way of taking the Lord's sacrament. Not even kidding. Nicholas oversaw Russia's epic defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. The 1905 revolution that led to Russia's first ever democratic body, the Duma, occurred on his watch. It drastically weakened the power of the Russian monarchy and was allowed only to prevent an all-out revolt. And then finally, during the February and October revolutions in 1917, the last Russian czar was overthrown by a remarkably small group of communists led by Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. And then less than a year later in the Russian Civil War, the entire imperial family, including Nicholas's 13-year-old son and potential successor, assassinated in the town of (laughs) Yekaterinburg. I think it's close. And these assassinations brought the Romanov dynasty to a bloody, indefinite end. No more Russian royal family. No more czars. And then it was gulags for decades. Yay! Yay! Broken bottles up asses and all the other gruesome shit we learned about in the KGB suck. Good job, communists, getting rid of a royal family and somehow making life much worse for everyone. Uh, Bojangles just laughed a bit at that. None of the czars I just went over would have ever existed if not for Ivan the Terrible creating that leadership position. And how did Ivan create the position of czar? With the blessing of the Russian church that he strengthened. A church that wanted to further increase the scope of its power through Ivan. To fully understand Russian culture during Ivan's time, it's important to wrap one's head around a bit of the Russian Orthodox Church. While Stalin would usher in an atheistic communist regime hundreds of years later, it was his nation's devotion to Christianity, the strain of belief taught by the Russian Orthodox Church that allowed his cult of personality and religion of the state to occur. When Ivan was born, the Russian Orthodox Church was one of the largest ecclesiastically independent Eastern Orthodox churches in the world. Still is. Current membership estimated to be around 112 million people, around 100 million of them in Russia. Makes sense. Long before the Protestant Reformation began in the early 16th century that led to all the non-Catholic, not going to listen to the Pope anymore, Protestant denominations of Baptists, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, Pentecostals, Calvinists, etc., etc., there were a few Eastern Orthodox branches that split away from Rome. Some Eastern churches split with Rome in the 5th century, others, including the branch the Russian church branched out from in the 10th century. Christianity was first introduced into the state of Kievan uh, Kiev, Kievan Rus, that loose federation of East Slavic and Finnic peoples in the late 9th century, accomplished by Greek missionaries from Byzantium, back before the East told Rome to peace out. An organized Christian community is known to have existed at Kiev as early as the first half of the 10th century. In 957, St. Olga, the regent of Kiev, was baptized in Constantinople. This act was followed by the acceptance of Christianity as the state religion after the baptism of Olga's grandson, Vladimir I, Prince of Kiev, in 988, the year the church lists as uh, when it was founded. Under this Vladimir's successors, and until 1448, the Russian church was headed by the Metropolitans of Kiev, who after 1328 resided in Moscow and formed a Metropolitanate of the Byzantine Patriarchate. Uh, Patriarchate. Uh, Patriarch... Yes. Okay. I said it right. Okay. (laughs) And yes, I just threw some very uncommon words out there. 
Uh, I'd never said any of those out loud before this week ever. Uh, let, let's, let's explain what these terms mean. A metropolitan in the Eastern Orthodox Church was the head of an ecclesiastical province. Originally, a metropolitan was a bishop of the Christian church who resided in the chief city or metropolis of a civil province of the Roman Empire and for ecclesiastical purposes administered a territorial area. So like, like yeah, like a, a Roman Catholic bishop. You know, it would be the head, he would reside in the biggest church of a, a you know, a geographical area where that church was like the capital, kind of like the capital city of a province. Um, the first known use of this title comes from the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE. We'll meet a few metropolitans, metropolitans, excuse me, in Ivan the Terrible Story today. Basically, think, think of that term as being interchangeable with archbishop, a bigwig, a church leader, and a patriarchate. Is the official is the office, excuse me, of a patriarch who is the kind of leader, but not really of the Eastern Orthodox Church. Under the unlike the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church doesn't have a true pope equivalent. They have metropolitans who are basically again these archbishops who each oversee a region, and these uh, you know archbishops lead the church collectively. With the Archbishop of Constantinople being known as the first among equals, and the symbolic leader of the other leaders. It can be a bit confusing, I know. And it's not why we're here today, so I won't spend forever trying to wrap my head or yours around Eastern Orthodox historical leadership hierarchy. For our story today, just know that the Metropolitan of Moscow took young Ivan the Terrible under his wing and sold him on this vision of turning Muscovy into a new Roman Empire, where the Russian Orthodox Church would be its Roman Catholic equivalent and he would be its Pope equivalent. The man who would give Ivan the authority to basically act on behalf of God to rule the Russian people didn't do it out of the goodness of his heart. He did it to gain more power of his own. He tried to sell Ivan on this concept of Moscow, excuse me, being the, quote, third Rome. Uh, the first, obviously, being Rome. The second Rome being Constantinople, capital of the Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire. And, the, and, and this guy wanted, you know, Moscow to be the next big Christian city, big headquarters for a huge Christian empire. The Russian Orthodox Church had been growing in power in Moscow for over two centuries prior to Ivan's rule, thanks largely to the Mongols who conquered it. While Russia lay under Mongol rule from the 13th through the 15th century, the Russian church enjoyed a favorable position, obtaining immunity from taxation that led to a remarkable growth of monasticism. It was a good time to be a monk. The Mongols would leave you alone if you were a monk. Monasticism is an institutionalized religious practice or movement whose members attempt to live by a rule that requires works that go beyond those of either the common man or the ordinary spiritual leaders of their religions. Commonly celibate, always ascetic, Asceticism being a lifestyle characterized by abstinence from sensual pleasures, the monastic individual separates himself or herself from society either by living as a religious recluse or by joining a community of others who profess similar intentions. And so there was a huge rise in monasteries and, you know, uh, convents, basically like, you know, nuns and, and monks. And for several centuries leading up to the birth of Ivan, Russian Orthodox monks and clergy and nuns and, and metropolitans, etc., kept the Russian people's culture alive while they lived under Mongol Muslim rule. And the Russian people came to be very faithful in their Orthodox beliefs this, during this time. And they placed a great deal of trust in their monks and spiritual leaders. And then Ivan would manipulate that trust to do what he wanted in the name of God. God wants you to be tortured. He, he must want it. If not, why would I do it? For I am God's chosen emperor. He was that dude. The Tsar's power, Ivan once said, does not come from the people, but from God. By succession from the first Russian autocrat, Saint Vladimir, so he is answerable not to the people, but to God. And the people, being not godless, recognize this. Right? See what he says there? Don't fucking question me. Right? If you question me, then I guess you're questioning God, because I work on behalf of God. And Ivan will fucking go off in the name of God, as you'll see soon. And he mainly will go off on the boyars, Russia's aristotic, aristocratic class. The boyars were powerful, wealthy landowners in Muscovy and Kiev and Rus. During the 10th through the 12th century, the boyars constituted the senior group within the Prince of Moscow's group of advisors. Now, uh, these entourage peeps called Druzina. The boyars occupied the higher posts in the armed forces and in the civil administration. They also formed a boyar council, or Duma, which advised the prince in important matters of state. If the prince were akin to a president, the boyars were akin to senators, but wealthy senators like of Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, were also senators and bent laws to make themselves even more wealthy and powerful. You know, sh shitty for everyone beneath them, uh, fun for them. 
The Boyers were a privileged class of rich landowners who served the prince as his aides and counselors, but also retained the right to leave the prince's service at any time and enter into the service of another, possibly rival prince, without losing their land and money. These motherfuckers had clout, lots of clout. Some Boyers at various times were, you know, probably more powerful for all intents and purposes than the princes they advised. And Ivan hated these dudes. And he would go on to destroy many of them and destroy much of the clout for those who lived. Now, before we go into the timeline, let's look at how terrible Ivan really was. Let's start off with the massacre of Novgorod. Ivan had Novgorod, a one-time rival city to Moscow, a city that Ivan already ruled completely and systematically and horrifically fucking destroyed in 1570 CE on the basis of unproven and likely fabricated accusations of treason. Ivan was paranoid. He was worried the city would either side with the king of Poland uh, and, and turn on him or possibly try and form its own thing. And he wanted to eliminate these possibilities. He, he, uh, he chose to annihilate the city to send a message to other cities that he will crush you if he even thinks you're disloyal. He may have also mostly done this because he was legitimately crazy. Mental illness manifested in the worst ways is always a possibility when it comes to this guy's decision making. He was very paranoid, very bloodthirsty, quite possibly not in his right mind. Ivan and his children of darkness would torture and kill men, women, and children alike in this city. Thousands and thousands would die in an organized over five-week-long massacre. Shit went full evil in Novgorod. Ivan's private Aprishniki army made it into the city four days before Ivan did, and they built a barrier around the city, trapping inhabitants inside. They then attacked a few monasteries surrounding the city, looting their treasuries, beating and imprisoning their clergies. That had to have been a stressful couple of days for the citizens of Novgorod. Just watching Ivan's infamous children of darkness build a barrier around your town, not to keep invaders out, which was the usual reason for doing this, but to keep you inside. You have to know nothing is good or nothing good is coming your way, you know, from that. Hey, Igor, get a load of this. Look at the darkness, kids. Build wall with spike on this side. Why spike inside wall? That, that feel bad. That feel very much bad. Look, they have many monk tied up. Monk guys looking pretty bloody. Oh boy, I know Soothsayer. I know Oracle of Delphi. I, I have pretty good idea of future. It's, it not look good. <laughs> I go drink much vodka now and probably dry and drown self in river or something. Uh, after his children of darkness and some other soldiers set things up, slap some clergy around for about four days. Ivan shows up with 1,500 additional regular soldiers, sets up a base camp just outside of town. He has all the clergy that have been rounded up, and beaten, brought before him, and his 16-year-old son, Ivan Ivanovich, and he accuses these people of being traitors, and he has them beaten to death. F fun bonding times with his boy. Go ahead, son. Grab sword. Cut some monk throat. <laughs> grab, a, grab rock. Bash monk head in. Enjoy youth. Make father proud. Beat tied up scared man to death for papa. Then Ivan and Junior greet the Archbishop of St. Sophia Cathedral, the Metropolitan, the primary church of Novgorod, on a bridge over the Volkov River that led to the city's main entrance. And there, Ivan berates this Metropolitan, this man named Piman, for being a traitor, then goes to St. Sophia Cathedral, and has this guy lead a church mass for him, then has him imprisoned, and his uh, opportunity start taking all the riches from the church. Take the church's treasury. Over the course of the next few weeks, Ivan and his men will fuck up more churches and monasteries around the city. They end, end up destroying around 30 religious buildings in total. Meanwhile, Malyuta Skuratov, Ivan's Darth Vader, head of the Apertniki, has the town's boyars and business leaders rounded up, brought to a special court slash torture chamber he set up in the city. And then there, while Ivan and Junior watch and sometimes participate, Malyuta and Ivan's henchmen go full medieval on some asses, interrogating the boyars and other upper-class members of the city, trying to get them to confess to wanting to pledge allegiance to the Polish king. In some cases, men are literally roasted on spits. Roasted on spits! Like they were rotisserie chickens. Dudes still alive, chained to metal rods, roasted over an open fire. I'm guessing a lot of people confessed to a lot of shit they didn't do when they were being roasted on a spit. Hard, hard to confess to, uh, you know, whatever your, your torture, hard not to confess to whatever your torture wants you to say if you're being roasted. Yes, I did it. I told Polish king. He might leave them now. Yes. I said same thing to king of England and, and France and Sweden and China, uh, a couple kings in Africa maybe, uh, maybe told some Incan king in South America. What, what the, whatever you want. Please stop roasting me. Uh, Ivan also had special frying pans created for this occasion. Had dudes fried, <laughs> not even joking, in a giant skillet like they were fucking fish fillets. So ridiculous. 
And uh, it's such a weird visual to me, like a giant frying pan. It makes me makes me think of like a like a huge cookie head working for him, like a giant cook, some impossibly big dude with a big spatula in his hand, dressed like a short order cook. <laughs> you know, he's constantly taking smoke breaks in my mind. He looks like a Andre the Giant, some like a like a ten times Andre side, just working the grill. How you want this guy's cooked, Ivan? Medium well. Faces side up. You like insides, bit runny, yes. You like hot brown with the guy skillet thing? Then according to one sor- source, Ivan had the archbishop killed. According to others, he had him sent to another church. Uh, I believe the death version. Uh, in this version, <laughs> this is so ridiculous, but I do believe it based on other things I've read about this guy. Uh, in the version that he has this guy killed, Ivan has him sewn up in, in a bearskin rug somehow. Like the sources don't go into great detail about that. I don't, know, I don't know why I'm laughing. I know it's not funny. This is so fucking ridiculous. And then he has this guy released and hunted to death, hunted to death uh, by a pack of hounds. I just picture them, I guess, probably sewing the bearskin rug onto, onto his dude's back with the head kind of flopped over his head, probably sewed onto his, on his forehead or something. So when he runs, he's looking, he's looking like a dude, like in a bear costume. I mean, this stuff is just cartoonishly brutal. And he, and he wasn't done. T- time for the common folk to take their whoopings. Various men, women, and children tied to sleighs, which were then run into the, like, basically like sleds. And then they just pushed him into the frozen waters of the Volk of River. What? That's families tied to sleds. They just pushed down the banks into the river. Come on, you guys. You're making the sad. Why not you yelling, we? Come on. You're supposed to yell, we, when going for a fun sleigh ride. Uh, those who climbed out of the water and tried not to drown were uh, hit with axes and swords and other weapons or like, you know, just stomped back down underneath the water. A German mercenary who witnessed this wrote about Ivan participating that day, saying, mounting a horse and brandishing a spear, he charged in and ran people through while his son watched the entertainment. Yeek! Uh, the exiled thousands of other people kicked him out of their homes, told him to get walking to Poland. You want to live in Poland? All right, get, get to walking. Now, it's only hundreds of miles over there. Go on, get. And he did this in the middle of the Russian winter. So anybody who were sent out like that likely froze to death. Novgorod never recovered. Estimates regarding casualties range consider- considerably anywhere from 1,200 to 60,000 dying. I say never. I guess, you know, decades later, they would, they would recover. After, you know, everybody who was involved in that in any way was dead, they would, they would recover. They are a city. Uh, another famous instance of Ivan's cruelty involves a metropolitan named Philip. Philip was a dude who dared to denounce Ivan's reign of terror. Not a good move. If you didn't want to die, a miserable death. Toward the end of his days, this guy wrote, it is better to die as an innocent martyr than to tolerate horrors and lawlessness silently in the rank of Metropolitan. And when Ivan made it to Met- Metropolitan Philip's church, he took his anger out on everyone there. He had the church treasurer, just some dude who didn't even say shit about him, just some dude who was good at moving numbers around, had that dude boiled to death in a cauldron. Had another dude hanged while men took turns hacking off parts of his body. Another dude was blown up by being tied to a barrel of gunpowder they then lit. Fuck. Uh, what about Metropolitan Philip himself? Ivan had this guy imprisoned in a dingy cell in this monastery, chains hanging from his wrists and ankles, heavy collar around his neck. He was starved, you know, not, not given him food or water for days on end. Uh, at one point, he, quote, escaped the appetite of a hungry bear, it's written. I'm guessing that means they, they taunted him with a bear, made him think the bear was going to kill him, made him, you know, beg for mercy to their amusement. Eventually, he was uh, strangled to death by Ivan's Darth Vader, Malyuta Skuratov. And uh, so many more stories. Some sources say Ivan carried an iron-pointed staff with him everywhere he went and that he would just randomly fucking whack and bludgeon people who pissed him off. Like, you could be... <laughs> you could be giving him some report he asked you. You know, he doesn't like what you what you just had to say and he would just beat you with a stick. Sometimes to death. There's a story that once he had a peasant woman stripped naked and used as target practice by his children of death. No real reason given. Just uh, just felt like doing that. Just felt like giving the boy some target practice. Maybe he just didn't like the way he, she looked at him. Can you imagine living under these conditions? It's so hard to fathom. I mean, Ivan could have your wife or husband, you know, the mother or father of your kids stripped naked in the middle of town just because, uh, I don't know, you, you know, you, you, they looked at him the wrong way, he thought. Or, be, or, or be, you know, because he felt like just using them for target practice. And your family would have no recourse. If you complained, you, you could be either A, ignored. That was best case. Best case is you're ignored. B, also horribly killed. That's worst case. Picture this happening today to get a true sense of how outrageous this is. This is going to sound so over the top, and it is, but this is what life was like for a Russian peasant under, under the, or, you know, fucking, fuck peasant, for a Russian 
anybody living under Ivan the Terrible, you know, because he went after the, the nobility as well. Picture you're out of Starbucks. You're grabbing a grande ice mocha. Half the pumps. Trying to watch your sugar. Al- almond milk. No whip. You know, whatever it is you drink. Uh, your partner grabs a venti matcha green tea latte. Coconut milk. Two extra scoops of matcha. Want a little more. A little juice. Hot. You know, or, or whatever it is they drink. The two of you are waiting for your drinks. And then, uh, you know, President Trump rolls up with his entourage in a Starbucks. You know, or whoever is using him because he's he's our leader now. You know, the le- leader of your country, whatever country you're living in, rolls up. And your partner says, what the fuck? As in like, what's the president doing here? And that, but Trump thinks, she said, what a schmuck. And then Trump's like, her, get her clothes off and get her outside. Time for some target practice. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's think about this. And you try and stop some secret service officer or whoever from grabbing her. And that dude just fucking bashes you over the head with the club. Drops you to the ground, dazing you. Then as you, you know, you pick yourself up and kind of your eyes start to refocus. You see your terrified naked wife outside in the parking lot begging for her life. Her clothes have literally been ripped off of her body. And then you hear some secret, you know, service agent go, run, go on, run. And then your wife starts to run, fucking terrified, tears streaming down her cheeks, you cross the strip mall parking lot. And then you hear this gunshot. That's she makes it about 30 yards, right? You hear the Trump, you know, Sh- show her who's a schmuck, you know, and then these guys, you know, she just gets shot up, fucking falls down dead. And then these guys pop back into Starbucks, grab their coffees. And if they don't kill you, you know, they probably beat you for a while, at the very least. And then they just bounce. You know, maybe as they leave joking about how funny it was, you see how she ran? Oh shit, man. You see a look at her face? And then you have to go grab your dead wife's body and, and bring her home and figure out burial arrangements. This is what life was actually like for people living under a psychopath like Ivan the Terrible. Uh, another time, Ivan had several hundred beggars drowned in a lake because he didn't, he didn't like them. He didn't care for them. In another instance, Jerome Horsey, English explorer, diplomat, and politician who spent some time in Russia, wrote about how a minor royal some boyar known as Prince Boris Tolupa, a man Ivan didn't care for, was, quote, drawn upon a long, sharp-made stake, which entered the lower part of his body and came out of his neck, upon which he languished in horrible pain for 15 hours. Dude spent 15 hours impaled on a stake. I told you he loved Vlad the Impaler. Adding to the horror, this poor bastard's mom was brought in to say goodbye to her son, after he'd been impaled, bring mother in to talk to baby boy. See, I tell you, baby boy, fine. He just, he just likes to stick around here for some reason. <laughs> He's sticking around here because I put him on a, a giant stick. You see, you see what I did there. And then Ivan uh, has his mom literally beaten and raped to death by his children in darkness. The source said she was defiled to death. Then he had her body fed to his hounds. <laughs> Jesus. This dude was worse than like any Game of Thrones character. Uh, he was terrible to the women he loved too, most of them at least, after the death of his first wife, Anastasia. Anastasia, a uh, reportedly beautiful and subservient woman whom Ivan loved uh, as much as a monster like this fucker could love somebody for eight years. Uh, he did not roast her on a spit or impale her even one time. He was not nearly as nice to subsequent seven wives, especially to the last few. Ivan's sixth wife, Vasilia Melnentieva, was sent to a convent after she foolishly took a lover to be basically in prison for the rest of her days. And the dude she fooled around with impaled on a stick and put just under uh, her convent window. Wow. You love him now? I could arrange for you to spend time together. Put you on same stick. Make love shish kebab for you too. Uh, full disclosure about Vasilia. Some Russian historians don't think she was Ivan's actual wife, but a mistress. Not that that makes what happened any less savage. Uh, she'd be treated better than his next wife. She'd at least live. His seventh wife, Maria Dolkurka, Dolgurukaya, only 14 or 15 years old when she wed 50-year-old Ivan in 1580. On their wedding night, he found out she was not a virgin. He got pissed off. You know, she allegedly confessed to him that she had lost her virginity to another man. So the day after her wedding, the next day, he has her drown in the river. Seems excessive. Another legend about Ivan's cruelty revolves around St. Basil's Cathedral. St. Basil's Cathedral, literally the first image that pops into my mind when I think about Russia. To me, the most Russian of all images. Now a museum, it was built uh, uh, as a beautiful Russian church in Ivan's orders between 1555 and 1561 to commemorate both the siege of Kazan, final battle of the Russo-Kazan Wars that led to the fall of the Khanate of Kazan, also to commemorate the fall of Astrakhan, capital of the Astrakhan Khanate. The original super colorful building uh, contains eight churches ar- arranged around a ninth. It's, it's like an old cinema multiplex, but for churches. 
Instead of what movie are you going to watch tonight? It was like, uh, uh, what church are you going to catch this morning? I don't know if it was like that, but it was a bunch of churches wrapped up into one building complex. Uh, located in Moscow's Red Square, built over the grave of St. Basil the Blessed. It's an architectural marvel. And one uh, Ivan legend is that when Ivan the Terrible gazed on the completed cathedral, he was overwhelmed with its beauty. And to be sure that Postnik Yakolev, architect who created it, would never create anything more magnificent, he had the dude blinded. However, this common Ivan story, probably certainly a myth. As Yakolev, in cooperation with another master architect, designed the walls of the Kazan Kremlin and the Cathedral of the Annunciation in Kazan in 1561 and 1562, just after the completion of St. Basil's. Also designed the Northeast Chapel of St. Basil's in 1588, four years after Ivan's death, which would have been hard to do with no working eyeballs. Uh, perhaps the most terrible thing Ivan is attributed to have, uh, having done, at least according to several legends, uh, it was kill his own son in a fit of rage. Most historians have serious doubts about this actually happening, but for centuries, filicide, the murder of one's own child, has been the czar's most famous terrible thing. This alleged act was immortalized by Russian realist artist Ilya Repin, who between 1883 and 1885 made the famous painting Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan on 16 November 1581. A truly gruesome painting captures the dread and remorse on Ivan the father's face, and the story goes like this. Ivan had always had a good relationship with his eldest son, but on November 19th, 1581, he became very angry with his son's pregnant wife. Apparently because, I don't know, she was wearing some clothes that he didn't like her wearing. So he, so he beat her with his beaten stick, as one does. And as a result, she miscarried. And Junior was, you know, he was peeved. He, he was annoyed by his dad uh, beating his wife with a stick until she miscarried. So he confronted his dad, and then his father, in a sudden fit of rage, raised his iron-tipped staff, smacked his son too hard in the head, cracked his skull, and the prince lay in a coma for several days before succumbing to his festering wound. Whoopsies! Uh, and again, historians think this particular story likely fabricated, but it does sound kind of like par for the course with this dude. Despite all this violence, Ivan's reign was also a time of Russian revival and national unity and success. Uh, centuries later, Ivan would be promoted as a national, or promoted to be a national hero by dictator Joseph Stalin, who reinvigorated the legend of Ivan the Fourth as a demigod to help whip up Russian people's confidence during World War II. Uh, okay, now let's really get to know Ivan and further understand his rise to power in today's timeline right after a quick word from our sponsors. And now it is time suck, timeline time. Hail Nimrod. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. All right, let's really start at the beginning. Understand Russia. Understand Ivan. Long before the birth of Ivan the Terrible, way back in the 7th century BCE is when Russia really got started, when some Greeks started some colonies on the coast of the Black Sea, and when Scythians, ancient tribes of nomadic warriors who originally lived in what is now southern Siberia, began to occupy the southern Russian steppe. Mill millennia later, in the 3rd century CE, Goths settled on the western steppes of Russia. None of them, to my knowledge, wore trench coats or wore lots of black makeup or made a habit out of creeping out their classmates, but they were Goths nonetheless. A century later, in the 4th century CE, the Huns invaded southern Russia. A century before the famed Attila would lead these fierce warriors to conquer an empire that stretched from Central Asia to present-day France. Bulgars, Turkic semi-nomadic warrior tribes, settled the middle Volga region in the 5th century, which encompasses the drainage basin of the Volga River, longest river in Europe, in Central and Southern European Russia. More genes get mixed into the early Russian gene pool. 300 years later, the Khazars, another Turkish tribe, take control of the steppes and settle near the Volga. Eastern Slavs also established themselves at Kiev in the south and at Novgorod in the north of the century. More genes mixed in. In the 9th century, Scandinavians make contact with Constantinople and began to keep a trade route open to the south. An important man named Rurik is established as a leader at the settlement of Novgorod. Rurik was a Viking chieftain who arrived in the Lagoda region of modern-day Russia in 862. He founded the first significant dynasty in Russian history called the Rurik Dynasty. Old school Russian, like the original OG. Descendant to this dude would rule some part of present-day Russia continuously for 21 generations until 1612, 750 years. Ivan the Terrible, a descendant of this man. In 1882, one of Rurik's fellow Vikings, Oleg of Novgorod, founds the Russian state at Kiev, now the modern-day capital of Ukraine. A century and several Rurik's later, between 980 and 1015, Prince Vladimir the Great 
converts from paganism to Orthodox Christianity and rules the Rurik dynasty while spreading his newfound religion. His son, Yaroslav the Wise, reigns from 1019 to 1054 as Grand Prince, establishing a written code of law, and Kiev becomes a center of politics and culture in Eastern Europe. In 1147 CE, Moscow is mentioned for the first time in historical documents, just a tiny little trade and outpost on a hill. In 1156, the first Kremlin, a wooden stockade, is built in Moscow, just north of the Moskva, or Mosk, Moskva, Moskva River. A Kremlin, by the way, historically means a fortress inside a city. Numerous Russian cities have Kremlins. Uh, today, the name is synonymous with the Russian government in the same way the White House is synonymous with the U.S. government. So that's what the Kremlin is. 1223 CE, the Mongols began to conquer the Ruriks. Between 1237 and 1240, the Mongols returned to finish conquering Kiev and Rus, destroying cities including Kiev and Moscow. The Khan, a.k.a. leaders of the Golden Horde, also sometimes referred to as Tatars or Tatars, depending on, uh, you know, different pronunciations, will rule Russia until 1480, just 50 years before Ivan the Terrible is born in 1530. The Golden Horde was a fragment, still large and formidable, of the once gigantic Mongol Empire that would further fragment over time into various nations called Khanates that would become Islamic nations in the 14th century. The, the leaders of the Golden Horde, descendants of Genghis Khan or Genghis Khan, during the conquering, Batu, Genghis Khan's grandson, burns the city of Moscow and its Kremlin to the ground for the first of many, many times that Moscow will burn in 1238. Moscow, very, very burnable, as you're going to learn today. The center of the Orthodox Church has moved from Kiev to Moscow in 1326, the cornerstone lay, laid for the Cathedral of the Assumption. In 1328, the East Orthodox Metropolitan See, a.k.a. Archbishop, officially transfers from the city of Vladimir to the once tiny trading post of Moscow. Moscow's star is rising. Also, Ivan Kalita, a.k.a. Ivan I, key figure in Russian history, becomes Grand Prince of the Grand Duchy of Moscow, a.k.a. Muscovy, that pays taxes or you know, to its uh, Mongol overlords so it's not raised to the ground again. Ivan I would grow the wealth and power of Moscow into one of the richest principalities in Russia by utilizing the relative calm and safety of the northern city of Moscow to entice a larger and wealthier population to move there. I had some tourism board version of move to Moscow. Sure, it gets cold, but we get burned to the ground less, maybe. Butchered by invader, maybe less than some other places. 1337, Moscow and much of the Kremlin burn again. No marauders this time, just a random fire. In a wooden city that didn't have modern firefighters. Whole 99 years since the last massive fire, so, you know, life's still pretty good in Moscow. It's going to be so much more burning to come. Uh, Ivan I begins rebuilding the Kremlin in 1339. Uh, orders its pine palisades to be replaced with oak walls, which were, I guess, slightly less burny, slightly less apt to burn up. Things are good for a little over a decade. 1353, the Black Death, the plague, ravages Russia, claiming Ivan's disciple and successor, Simeon the Proud. Damn it. For more on the plague, check out our suck on it, episode 125. Beginning in 1359, the Grand Prince Dmitri, Ivan the First grandson, starts to replace Moscow's wooden stockade with stone walls and a new tower, only to have Moscow burn again. In 1365, tens of thousands hurt, killed, or displaced. Third fucking time in 121 years, the city is burned to the ground. Most of the Kremlin survives because, you know, they were starting to rebuild it with some, uh, with some stone. And they get back to building, uh, only to have Moscow catch fire again nine years later in 1368. Son of a bitch! That year, Lithuanians attack Moscow, burning all the houses outside of the Kremlin's new walls to the ground. Fourth time Moscow is burned in 130 years. Terrible place to live if you hate long, cold, brutal winters and or getting burned to a crisp. Two years later in 1370, the citizens of uh, Tver, or T Tver, 113 miles north of Moscow, uh, people in cahoots with the Lithuanians, come on down and burn all of the houses outside of the Kremlin's walls down again. Fifth time Moscow has burned in 141 years. Third time in 11 years. Good thing they rebuilt the Kremlin out of stone. How much would that have sucked if you lived just outside the walls and your house burned down three fucking times in just over a decade? Damn it! Why is there no brick guy in Moscow? Can we please get brick guy? Maybe stonemason? Concrete guy? Something? Anyone who build house out of not wood? For fuck's sake, it's too much. Uh, 1374, Muscovy rejects the authority of the Golden Horde's cons. This will, of course, lead to war. Six years later, in 1380, a major blow by the Russians is landed against the myth of Mongol invincibility in the Battle of Kulikovo, 
was fought near the Don River, celebrated as the first victory for Russian forces over the Tatars of the Mongol Golden, Golden Horde, demonstrated the developing independence of the Russian lands from Mongol rule, which had been imposed on the Rus people for 140 years now, giant step for the Duchy of Moscow and its rise to leadership over the Russian people, and a victory that would later inspire Ivan the Terrible to more victories against the Mongols. Also a victory that early Russians living in 1380 didn't get to enjoy very long because two years later, the Mongols would kick the living shit out of them for fighting them. In 1382, Khan uh, Totamish, another descendant of Genghis, sacks Moscow and captures the Kremlin. The destruction of Moscow leads to the prince of Moscow, Dmitry Donskoy, to surrender once again to the authority of a Khanate. Independence short-lived this time around. The princes of Moscow would vacillate back and forth between declaring themselves independent and being subjugated by various Khans for several decades until finally breaking free uh, from their rule under the, under the rule of Ivan the Terrible's grandfather, Ivan III. Seven years later, in 1389, damn near everything in Moscow but the Kremlin burns again, son of a bitch! Can we please get the brick guy? How many times do we have to burn before we learn someone to work, to work with brick? Oh, we're going to build with wood again. Okay, that's great. That's, I, I, fuck it. What's possibly wrong, go? This is sixth time uh, Moscow burned, 160 years. Uh, they, of course, would rebuild again with wood. <laughs> they were determined to keep this wooden city going. Beginning in 1425, 36 years later, the Grand Princes of Muscovy began acquiring more surrounding Russian lands to increase the population and wealth under their rule, building up strength, hopefully going to be able to fight the Mongols, you know, again soon. January 22nd, 1440, Ivan Vasilievich, also known as Ivan III, a.k.a. Ivan the Great, is born. This guy did a lot of conquering like his grandson would later do, but with way less insane raping and torturing. That's why he gets to be great, and the other guy's terrible. He would be the first prince of Moscow to call himself a czar, but it would be his grandson, of course, Ivan the Terrible, who would become the first true czar many decades later. Ivan III's father, Vasily II, also known as Vasily the Blind, was the grand prince of Moscow, whose long reign from 1425 to 1462 was plagued by the greatest civil war of old Russian history when various princes within Muscovy fought for power. At one point, Vasily was captured and blinded by his opponents, yet eventually reclaimed his throne. Tough-ass dude. In 1448, something big happened that would allow for Ivan the Terrible's rise to power years later. The Russian church in Moscow becomes effectively independent from the patriarchate of Constantinople when the Russian bishops in Moscow elect their own primate, Jonas, a Russian bishop who doesn't have to defer to Constantinople for shit. The primate, by the way, an Eastern Orthodox Church's uh, top church dog, the head metropolitan archbishop, not a pope, not a pope but the first among equals kind of thing, like, like uh, as close as it comes to Pope in the Orthodox Church. And now the Russian church, within the bounds of the Grand Duchy of Moscow, effectively its own thing. And this church would later bind itself to the czars, give the czars their holy power, and become basically what the Roman Catholic Church was to the Holy Roman Empire. 1452, Ivan III marries his first wife, Maria of Tver, daughter of Boris Alexandrovich of Tver, when he's 12 years old and she is 10. Different times, I guess. Open their wedding night, had some chaperones. Uh, pretty creepy, if not. Next year, Constantinople, captured by the Turks, ending the mighty Byzantine Empire. Former eastern half of the Roman Empire that lasted for roughly a thousand years after the fall of Rome. Constantinople was viewed as being the second Rome, and now the idea of Moscow being the third Rome. Uh, you know, the, the new massive Christian capital for the, for the new Christian Empire of Europe starts getting floated around. Religious leaders in Moscow want Moscow to kick the shit out of all the Catholics and Muslim Mongols around them and reign over a vast Christian empire where they have all the religious power, just like it was when the Pope had dominion over religion within the Byzantine Empire and prior to that within the Roman Empire. On February 15th, 1458, Ivan III and Maria of Tver have their only child, Ivan Ivanovich, known as Ivan the Young. Four years later, Ivan III takes the throne, becoming the Grand Prince of Moscow after spending much of the 1450s serving as co-ruler and, co er, and regent for his blind father, Vasily II. He has ambitious plans to grow the power of Moscow and tell the Mongols to fuck off for good. The now 22-year-old Ivan becomes the Grand Duke of Moscow without being confirmed as such by the Mongol Khan, breaking tradition, a sign of what's to come between he and the Mongols. He's not going to kiss the ring. He expands his territory as much as he can over the next several years while still being a, a vassal state. Uh, in 1467, Ivan's first wife dies, something from poison, something from natural causes. Uh, she was described as being sickly ever since she was a kid. 1469, the marriage between Sophia Palaiogina, the only niece of the last Byzantine emperor, and Ivan III is proposed by Pope Paul II. 
And this shows how far Muscovy has come, right? They're on the Pope's radar now, having the Pope, you know, uh, propose a marriage. This was done probably with the hope of strengthening the influence of the Catholic Church in Russia in hopes of uh, some kind of unification between the Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church. Ivan III's motives for pursuing this union were probably connected to the status he would gain tying himself through marriage to the former Byzantine Empire. Makes his claim for, you know, a uh, third Rome more legitimate. The formal wedding between Ivan III and Sophia takes place in Moscow, November 12th, 1472, a year after Ivan the Great invades Novgorod, makes it a puppet state. Ivan and Sophia would have a dozen children together, 10 of them surviving past infancy. Sophia, through her oldest boy, Vasily III, future Grand Prince of Moscow, would be Ivan the Terrible's grandmother. The next year, in 1473, another huge fire. Seventh fire in the past 244 years, if you're keeping track. One massive fire, just about every 35 years. Moscow is apparently the most flammable city on earth. Uh, the fire destroys most of the buildings of uh, the city of the Kremlin, of the Metropolitan's Court. Uh, in 1474, Ivan III dispatches some dudes to Venice to hire some kick-ass Italian architects to construct a new, please, for the love of God, hard-to-burn Kremlin. Finally, we get the brick guy. And I bet my cold Ruski ask he not to build a shit for common Russian. Kremlin be great. <laughs> Kremlin be great. My house still burns so much. Uh, 1475, Aristotle Fioravanti, a renowned Italian architect, engineer, uh, uh, arrives in Moscow and begins rebuilding the burnt up cathedral of the Assumption in the Kremlin. Also in 1475, Ivan establishes the first Russian cannon foundry in Moscow. Blown shit up would definitely be one of his uh, terrible grandson's favorite pastimes. 1476, Ivan refuses to pay his tribute to Khan Ahmed of the Golden Horde. He's now officially told him to fuck off. Khan Ahmed doesn't care for this. Four years later, took a while for things to get ready back then. 1480, the Golden Horde advances up the Urga, uh, uh, <laughs> Ugra River in an attempt to force the Muscovies to, to pay their tribute or an attempt to force Muscovy to pay tribute. And Ivan the Great's army kicks the shit out of them and they retreat. So, uh, hooray, Ivan has defeated the pesky golden horde, you know, Tatars, and gains freedom and, uh, from, you know, uh, subjugation to Khan Ahmed. Ivan also absorbs the Vir, uh, Vyatka into Muscovy, some more cities, rules it all from 1480 to 1505. In 1491, construction of the Palace of Facets is completed in the Kremlin, the Palace of Facets, a building in the Moscow Kremlin, which contains what used to be the main banquet reception hall of the Muscovite Tsars, and it's the oldest preserved secular building still in Moscow today. The lower section of Savior Tower, Kremlin's main gate, also finished in 1491. On J July 16th, 1493, another fire in the Kremlin destroys the Metropolitan's Court again. <laughs> Ivan III evacuates his fire damaged quarters. The fire at least spares the rest of Moscow this time. October 27th, 1505, Ivan the Great dies uh, at, at the age of 65 of natural causes, succeeded by his son, Vasily III, Ivan the Terrible's father. And Vasily III would spend most of his reign consolidating his father Ivan's territorial gains. In 1523, Moscow is truly dubbed the Third Rome. Orthodox monk Philo uh, Philotheus wrote letters to the Grand Duke of Moscow urging him to fight against heresies. Or heresies. Uh, the Duchy of Moscow, in the monk's view, remained the last bastion of the true Christian faith. Philotheus wrote, all the, kingdom, all the Christian kingdoms have come to an end and have converged in the single kingdom of our sovereign. Two Romes fell, a third stands, and there will not be a fourth. Ivan the Terrible would later, like a lot of psychopaths throughout history, really run with this idea of him being God's chosen warrior. Uh, in 1526, Vasily III, 47 years old, he's been married to, uh, to 36-year-old Salomnia Sabruva. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, for decades, and they still don't have an heir to the throne. And he's fucking pissed about it. Uh, and, and, and the more, and I've said this before, but man, <laughs> the, <laughs> the more I do like these old historical sucks, the more I understand like why in, in the U S at least at Ellis Island, they, they just cleaned up people's names. Cause some people get pissed at that. They're like, well, you know, this is my name, but I mean, it's supposed to be a papa -pa -pa -pa, and you know, they fucking changed it there. And that's, you know, that's, that's bullshit. No, they just changed it. Cause no one could fucking say any of these words. They just, you know, like when you grow up with one language and then you encounter this other language where they put, you know, seven extra vowels. Than you're used to in every word. You're like, your name's fucking what? No, no, no. Your name's Smith now. Okay? So put up put all the hard kind of Nah, we're gonna go with Johnson. We're gonna go with Johnson. Um, anyway. Uh <laughs> Vasily, 
I, I got that one. He's he's pissed about his wife not getting pregnant. He's saying stuff to his friends like, "How much how much dick do I have to give to this bitch before she pop kid out of us?" And his friends are like, uh, "Okay, I, th- I think I see what the problem is. You're you're, you're doing it wrong." Uh, no, none of that happens. But he does get frustrated with his wife, who is beloved by her people and beloved by the church, and he, and he is uh, frustrated, you know, for her not getting pregnant. He, he convinces some boyers that it would not be good if one of his brothers or one of his brother's brood comes into power, right? He needs to produce an heir. And so they suggest he takes a new wife. And then despite a lot of opposition from the clergy, he divorces his beloved but barren wife who hasn't done anything wrong other than just not get pregnant. And he marries a 16-year-old, Princess Elena uh, Glins- Glinskaya, daughter of a Serbian princess. Scandal. Not many of the boyers approve of this choice, right? There's a couple he consulted with. They're on board. Everyone else not on board. Church, not on board because she was raised Catholic. Not even Russian Orthodox, right? What is this? What is this guy going to stick his dick in a demon now? What's, what's going on here? Uh, Vasily, so smitten with Elena, he doesn't care who approves. He uh, defies Russian social norms, even trims his beard. Oh, gasp. To appear younger for her. This apparently was a big social no-no. And now the people are disgusted with him. Who is this guy? After three days of matrimonial festivity, the couple consummates their marriage and then more scandal. She doesn't get pregnant for the next few years. And now the Russian people begin to suspect her lack of getting pregnant as a sign that God doesn't approve of their marriage. God's pissed at their leader. Then in early 1530, she does get pregnant. A monster is forming inside her womb. It's Ivan the Terrible Time. Now we have made it back to Ivan. Makes me think of that ACDC song. When I'm back, when I'm back in black. Uh, August 25th, 1530, Ivan Vasilievich, Ivan IV, Ivan the Formidable, Ivan the Fearsome, Captain Poopy Pants, General Grumpy Gus, Lieutenant Look the Other Way. Those last three are nonsense. Ivan the Terrible Born in a former royal estate located several kilometers southeast of Moscow city center. And the people of Russia are not overjoyed. As I mentioned, the, the marriage of Vasily III to a younger woman, a woman who was raised Catholic no less, after being married for so long to Salamnia, frowned upon by the Russian people, a marriage the church did not approve of. Many of the boyers did not approve of it. Even people in other lands didn't approve of it, like the patriarch Mark of Jerusalem, of the of the Eastern Orthodox Church there, who wrote prophetically to the great prince, if you do this wicked thing, you will have an evil son. Your estate will become prey to terrors and tears. Rivers of blood will flow. The heads of the mighty will fall. Your cities will be devoured by flames. Maybe be pretty accurate. I mean, but of course you'd say flames, right? Not much of a prediction there, really. Dude just knew a little bit about Moscow's very flammable history. Uh, anyway, Ivan the uh, the Fourth's life started with this ominous warning. Two years later, on October 30th, 1532, Ivan's only sibling, his brother Yuri, is born. And then on December 4th, 1533, the next year, Ivan and Yuri's father dies from blood poisoning. Ivan is far too young to govern at only three years old. Although if they knew how terrible he'd become in later moments, you know, they might have just uh, gone ahead and just let him rule. He might have been a better ruler at three than he would be for for most of his adulthood. Uh, The governing of Russia falls to his mother and the Boyar Duma. Boyar Duma, a scholarly term used to describe the royal council or upper strata of the ruling elite in the 15th through 17th centuries in Russia. And Ivan's mother, young Alina, only 23 years old, she doesn't get along too well with the Boyar Duma. She rejects a lot of their advice, which, you know, doesn't sit well with them. They feel disrespected. And uh, this does not predispose them to be super nice to her sons. One historian wrote regarding Ivan's mom, the new regent acted in a haughty and arbitrary manner, disregarding the boyers and relying first on her uncle and after his death on her lover. And then on April 4th, 1538, four and a half years after his father's death, when Ivan is only seven years old, his mom dies and her lover is murdered a few days later. And very likely that she was murdered, like almost for certain. Uh, she was poisoned, assassinated by a member or members of the Boyard Duma, most likely poisoned by someone working uh, for members of the Shushki, Boyar family who would essentially take over and rule Russia when she died. Various members of the Shushki and Belsky Boyar families, arguably the two most powerful Boyar families in Muscovy, would rule for the next nearly nine years until Ivan reached the age of majority, the age of 16, when he was deemed old enough to take the throne. And Ivan would grow up to hate these Boyars. According to letters he'd later write, Ivan, along with his younger brother Yuri, often felt neglected and offended by the mighty Boyars from these families. In a letter he later wrote, Ivan remembers... My brother Yuri, of blessed memory, and me, they brought up like vagrants and children of the poorest. What have I suffered for want of garments and food? He paints this kind of uh, Oliver Twist depiction of his childhood. 
may or may not be true, but uh, probably definitely true that these guys uh, didn't didn't care for him very much, and he didn't care for them. Ivan's childhood was was not the childhood he felt was owed to him as a future prince of Moscow. His childhood was full of a lot of people he didn't care about kissing his ass, and a lot of people he he did care about ignoring him, at least in his his eyes. A historian wrote of his upbringing: all evidence suggests that Ivan the Fourth was a sensitive, intelligent, and precocious boy. He learned to read early and read everything that he could find, especially Muscovite church literature. He became of necessity painfully aware of the struggle and intrigues around him and also of the ambivalence of his own position. The same boyars who formerly paid uh, obeisance to him as an autocrat treated him with utmost respect on ceremonial occasions, neglected, insulted, and injured him in private life. In fact, they deprived him at will of his favorite servants and companions and ran the palace as well as Russia as they pleased. Bitterness and cruelty expressed, for instance, in his torture of animals became fundamental traits of the young ruler's character. Uh, and yes, it seems like many future uh, sociopaths, he did torture animals as a child, or as many sociopaths. Uh, when he was young, he, he tortured animals. By the age of 12, he, he was uh, apparently known to torture cats, also rumored to have torn the feathers off of birds, gouged the eyes out of various pets, all kinds of horrible stories about what he did to animals. Also witnessed the boyars around him do a lot of horrible shit. Young Ivan watched various mentors and servants who cared for him end up getting murdered. One of his mentors was uh, apparently skinned alive for being a traitor. That really stuck with me, man. Whenever I hear that term, skinned alive. How possible is that? How much skin do you have to have flayed off of you before you die? Can you, can you live with no skin? I did way too much Googling to try and find out the answer to this question. Can you live with all your skin skinned off, flayed off, you know? If after all this time, I, I still wasn't on some type of criminal watch list, I must be on one now. Some sources say you can live for a full day after having all your skin taken off, but I don't, you know what? I don't buy it. Not all of your skin. It seems that when one was skinned alive, they had large chunks of their skin removed, but not all of it. Like most of their skin on their back would be flayed and peeled off, or, or maybe most of their chest skin, maybe a good deal of skin on portions of their thighs, calves, upper arms. But think about how hard it would be to have like your hands and your, and, and your feet skinned or your face and neck skin, or your balls, or your vagina, your taint, you would die before anyone got all of your skin. Nothing I can find points to a definitive case of one person losing literally all their skin, like right down to their eyelids, and somehow still being alive. Not that any of that would be any kind of, you know, consolation to someone who lost just like half their skin. You know, I don't think you'd be standing in some medieval dungeon saying, oh, this is nice. This is not near as bad as I mentally prepare for. I thought that I was going to lose all skin. I have like half my skin left. I can live with this. I can make this work. I still got my face skin. I still got my hand and feet skin. It could be a good look for me. Uh, regardless of how much skin his mentor lost, crazy that young Ivan witnessed something like that growing up. Uh, for many years, the boyars fought for control of Russia while the young Ivan suffered quietly with his brother, neglected, used, possibly even physically abused. And, and then he uh, you know, took his anger out on various small animals. Then on December 29th, 1543, 13-year-old Ivan decides uh, he's, he's had enough. He's not taking the boy your shit anymore. He's not quite the prince yet, but he's going to send a message to, to, you know, to lay off, treat him with some respect. And he, and he orders the death of one of his least favorite boyers. This is the, the first person he, he orders a death for, supposedly, saying that they were following the grand prince's orders. A group of guards march into the quarters of one of the cruelest boyers, arrest the man, feed him to a pack of wild dogs. That'll teach him. Ivan has just made a pretty big statement. Uh, he's in charge now, and he's not to be fucked with. If you're going to fuck with him, all right, well, then you're going to get fed to wild dogs. And I think it's pretty safe to assume he did not get fucked with a whole bunch after that. Uh, by the following year in 1544, young Ivan, allegedly roaming the streets of Moscow, he's kind of a you know punk youth with a pack of associates, dishing out beatings to whoever he wanted beaten, and possibly, according to some sources, raping various women, and then disposing of their bodies so they didn't spread rumors about him. Had him, had him hanged, buried alive, fed to wild animals, drowned in the river, if we're to believe all the rumors. Some of this might just be slanderous accusations written about those who didn't like him. He did have many enemies. Uh, however, you know, there is a decent chance at least some of it is true. According to most sources, you know, he did spend his identity shaping years just becoming a brutal sociopath. Also, really got into the church. Uh, interesting duality there. Weird combo. He began to spend a lot of time, you know, beaten and raping and also a lot of time studying the church under the tutelage of Moscow's metropolitan uh, Macarius, who started really selling him on that third Rome idea. January 16th, 1547, Ivan is crowned Grand Prince of all Russia. His regency has come to an end, and he does something no Prince of Moscow had done before. He has himself crowned with the church's blessing, administered via his buddy Macarius, czar and autocrat of all the Russias. 
in Moscow's Cathedral of the Assumption. This new title symbolized an assumption of powers equivalent, parallel to those held by Byzantine emperors, Tatar Khans, you know, the Roman Caesar. Uh, the political effect of this was to elevate Ivan's position to extreme, unquestionable, super duper leader of everything. This was Macarius's play to have Muscovy be the new center of a new Byzantine empire. Ivan's coronation of Tsar, an elaborate ritual modeled after those of the Byzantine emperors. When it was over, he declared all of Russia united under his rule. There's a new sheriff in town. And you best listen to him because he is not afraid to lay some hurt on your ass. And he is also, and I cannot emphasize this enough, batshit fucking crazy. We have a new, very unstable sheriff in town. Buckle up, Moscow. It's going to be a wild ride. Uh, February 3rd, 1547, two weeks after his coronation, Ivan marries the boyar Anastasia, or Anastasia Romanov, Romanov, Romanovna. Uh, she is one of the Romanovs. The, even they shortened one of their names. They're like, we need to fucking cut the nah at the end. It's, it's nonsense. Romanovna, ah, doesn't roll off. Romanov, end with the hard consonant. Stop adding all this extra shit. Uh, yeah, she's one of the Romanovs, the family who would later be the last czars to rule Russia after her son's death ends the Rurik dynasty and her lineage begins a new bloodline with Tsar Michael I. Uh, she was Michael's great aunt. Anastasia, selected as the best bride for Ivan from a large number of suitable mates, brought to the Kremlin specifically for a selection process. All the noble families throughout Russia given an invitation to present their eligible daughters. It said he picked from between 500 and 1,500 girls. <laughs> My God. After declaring himself basically the emperor of Russia, Young Ivan immediately takes aggressive action against the Tatars of Kazan, who live some 400 miles southeast of Moscow on the River Volga. They'd persistently raided Muscovy for loot and slaves for the markets of Persia and Turkey. They've been at it for hundreds of years, and he wanted to prove to his people that he was worthy of his new title by putting an end to that shit. Ivan built the fortress of Savaski on the east bank of the Volga as an advanced base to attack the Khanate of the Kazan. Apparently, it was prefabricated with numerous components floated down the river like some fucking piece of Ikea furniture. Pretty clever. Uh, Ivan threatened a holy war against the Muslims, to which the Khan of Kazan replied, All is ready for you here. We invite you to the feast. That's a pretty badass shit to say. Right? He sends this guy a letter like, Hey, man, we're fucking coming for you. We're tired of you looting our shit. And he's like, All is ready for you here. We invite you to the feast of blood. Uh, Khan didn't fear Ivan one bit. And then he easily defended his lands against, uh, against Ivan's armies, initial, against their initial attacks. Not a good way for Ivan to start his reign. Not a good look when you're trying to make it appear as if God is on your side. Then things get a lot worse quickly for Ivan with another fire. Who would have guessed it? What do they build the houses out of in this town? Kindling? Paper mache? Soaked in kerosene? Solid town to be a contractor in. Joe, and, Joe Pays and I were talking about this. So uh, picturing like some wealthy contractor living just outside of town in a huge castle made out of stone and gold and jewels with a giant lumber yard behind his castle. Oh, we need to be rebuilding again. I'm happy to rebuild. <laughs> no shortage of work here in Moscow. I get the wood ready. I don't know why that guy was Scandinavian. Uh, yes, major fire strikes Moscow for the ninth time. <laughs> so many fires. And this time, since the city's a little bigger than it had been a few centuries prior, it does more damage. It destroys 25,000 wood dwellings, damages portions of the Kremlin, even blew up powder stores in several of the Kremlin's towers. This is a big fire. The fire started on June 24th, 1547, barely six months into Ivan's reign. And it displaced about 80,000 of his people. Uh, killed anywhere from 2,700 to 3,700. Uh, some that didn't include kids for some reason. They didn't bother to count how many kids got burned up. Ah, it's, I don't know, 5,000 kids, whatever. We'll, we'll make more. Uh, led to widespread poverty amongst the survivors. Russian author and historian Nikolai uh, Karmisin described the blaze. The fire flowed like a river and soon the Kremlin Kite Gorod, a dense part of the city next to the Kremlin and the trading quarter burst into flames. The crackling of fire and the cries of people from time to time were drowned out by explosions of gunpowder, which was stored in the Kremlin and other parts of the city. It's chaos. Making things worse, like much of the rest of Europe, the people of Moscow believed strongly in shit like witches and wizards and the dark powers of the occult. And rumors almost immediately started to spread that the fire was the result of sorcery instead of something much more reasonable, like someone, you know, dropping a lit pipe or falling asleep before putting out the fire in their stove. These rumors focused on the Glinsky family. They set the fire, fucking Glinskys, using their witchcraft. Uh, Muscovites believe that Anna Glinsky, Ivan's grandmother, uh, quote, by sprinkling the houses and streets with water in which human hearts had been soaked, set the city alight. That witch! 
and they felt the rest of the Glinskys were evil as well. So mobs of scared, angry people. Like picture like the classic medieval scene of a mob of peasants holding torches and pitchforks. Kill the witch! Find the witch! Burn them! Uh, started hunting the Glinskys down. Like, like they're going through the, the burnt remains of this city looking for these people. Uh, burn the wizards! Kill the... Stone them! That kind of vibe. Yuri Glinsky, Ivan the Force uncle, literally runs through the streets being chased by this fucking mob. He tries hiding in a church only to be dragged out into the street and stoned to death in the square. And then the mob continues to search for other families. We must kill them all! Burn the witches! A few days later, a mass of city residents turn up at a royal palace at the village of Vor- uh, Vorobyovo near Moscow where Ivan the Fourth had gone to escape the fire. They demanded the Tsar's grandmother be brought out to be punished, you know, to be killed. Ivan the Terrible is terrified. He later reflected on this event. Fear ignited in my soul and shivered in my bones. Ivan was able to convince Muscovites he was not hiding any of the Glinsky family members and the crowd left without killing his grandma. And he would be haunted by the memory of this for the rest of his days. Uh, important to note that as barbaric as Ivan was, he also was a reflection of the times he lived in. Shortly afterwards, Ivan returned to the city, saddened by what he saw. The poverty he created was devastating, left thousands possessing nothing more than the clothes on their backs. He turned his attention away from attacking the Mongols, focused on fire safety in the city, about time. He ordered a new law by which all Moscow residents had to place a barrel of water in their yard, another one on the roof of their house. They were also ordered to construct ovens and fireplaces in kitchen gardens and waste grounds far from dwellings. The burning of ovens and houses forbidden during the summer also has the first water pumps invented for the purpose of fire extinguishing built in Moscow. Finally! Finally, we get some guy who do something about fire. We still not have fucking brick guy for common folk. Still wood, but now we have water for wood, and that that is good. So 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 far as a leader, Ivan not terrible, not so terrible. Two years later, in 1549, the first Zemsky Sabor, the Russian Parliament, also known as Assembly of the Land, convenes. Uh, generally composed of representatives from the uh, ecclesiastical and monastic authorities, the Boyar Council, the landowning classes urban freemen, elections for representatives and sessions of each group held separately. Ivan was the leader, right, by birth, but the rest of the people have a voice in government and, and, and Ivan hates it. Soon he'll figure out how to rule without having to run anything by anyone. Uh, two years later in 1551, Ivan introduces a new legal code. The new system aims at the elimination of corruption and oppression on the part of centrally appointed officials by means of popular participation in local affairs. Various localities had already received permission to elect their own judicial authorities to deal with crime. Now in areas whose population guaranteed a certain amount of dues to the treasury, other locally elected officials replaced these centrally appointed governors. And even when the governors remained, the people could elect assessors to check on those governors. So interesting. Uh, Could impeach them, impeach them, excuse me, when necessary. So he weakens the power of much of the nobility by doing this. Now he, he keeps his title again as being a hereditary one, but he's now taken away the, the power of the nobility. You know, more people get to be voted in. He's crafty. He also further weakens the nobility by canceling the right of the boyars to basically kill any peasant they wanted for any reason at all. He could still do that, but they couldn't do that anymore, which makes life a little better for many. And how nuts is that? That before he, he, has, to, he has to pass a law to get rid of that. Hey, no more just kill whoever wants for any reason. We, that's probably not good. I, I still do it, but not for everyone. Makes me think of my Starbucks example again from earlier. Uh, despite passing these reforms, Ivan, yeah, yeah, not a man of the people. He didn't give a shit about the rights of the peasants. He just does this stuff to weaken the, the nobility. Uh, shortly after revoking the rights of the boyars to do whatever they wanted to peasants, a group of 70 peasants comes to Ivan to complain about being abused by their boyar. And Ivan doesn't think their gripe is warranted, and he responds by having them stripped naked and their beards set on fire. So yeah, again, not a man of the people. Following year, 1552, after getting Moscow rebuilt a bit, passing some new laws to prevent future fires, you know, making his people feel empowered, giving them a voice. Ivan the young czar refocuses on kicking that Mongol ass, right? He didn't get to it the way he wanted to before the fire. He's getting whooped a little bit. Now he's got to prove himself. He sets out uh, by leading a Russian army, perhaps 150,000 strong, to besiege Kazan, a walled, moated town on a hill on June 16th, 1552. They make it to Kazan. It was uh, 719 kilometers, 447 miles away. Uh, to the southwest in August, and on September 2nd, the siege begins. This is Ivan's first really big war, the first time he's really trying to take another capital. I mean, he'd had some little skirmishes against his Khanate before, but this is is the real deal. This is the big one. His first big Christian versus Muslim, Jesus versus Muhammad, my God's tougher than your God, no excuses if I lose battle. 
If he loses, the boyars and peasants back home could likely revolt. His reign could be over. No pressure. He has infantry, cavalry, uh, arc, arc, arc These soldiers armed with this early type of gun, uh, heavy artillery, uh, barrels of gunpowder. The Muscovites bombard the wooden walls of the Khanate with cannons, but are unable to break through. Their infantry assaults are initially beaten back, and then storms and torrential rain uh, blows down the Muscovite tents, turns their camp into a muddy bog. It's not looking good for the Russians early on in the siege. The Russians blame the weather on pagan magic. That sounds about right. Uh, then they have some uh, crucifix believed to contain a fragment of the true cross brought to the scene, and then the bad weather stops, and they take this as a sign that God is now on their side. Right, big morale boost. Our God wants you guys wants you guys dead. Uh, Tatra prisoners are then tied to stakes close to the walls in a hope that their pleas might persuade the defenders to surrender. But that didn't work because the Mongols were ruthless. The uh, Tatra bowmen silenced the screams of their own by shooting their own people. Ivan's next play was to blow up their defenses. He has men known as sappers dig tunnels under the walls of their fortress, explode barrels of gunpowder, which knock down sections of the walls above them. These men also blew up the town's water system, harder to wait out a siege when you run out of clean drinking water. After almost six weeks, the defenses are weakened enough for Ivan to give his men the green light to storm the town. The Tatar defenders are overwhelmed. Many are slaughtered that day. Ivan had done it. He had taken Kazan. Kazan fell on October 13th, two days after Dmitri, his first son and third child, is born back home. He's He's having a good week. He's 22. Life is going pretty well. Things look rough for a second when his capital city was on fire and crazy locals were trying to burn his grandma alive for being a witch. Things are better now. Now he has an heir to the throne, major victory under his belt. He returns to a hero's welcome in Moscow. In Kazan, he has the Muslim population expelled, kicks them the fuck out. Russian Orthodox Christian colonists are moved in. Mosques are replaced by Russian Orthodox churches and the Tatars of the surrounding country forced to convert to Christianity or be killed or exiled. He's building that third Rome. Then he gets really sick. Following year, the spring of 1553, he gets really sick as people did all the time in the days before vaccines and antibiotics. And he thinks he's going to die at only 23 years old. Also very common back then. He gathers the top boyars to his bedside, asks them to swear allegiance to his son, Dimitri. And these fuckers who also think he's going to die, they refuse. They're like, nah, nah, we don't like your, we don't like your son. We don't like your baby son. Uh, they swear allegiance to Ivan's cousin instead. And then, unfortunately for these uh, nobles, Ivan does not die. And also unfortunate for them, his infant son, Dimitri, does die on June 23rd. Now he really hates these guys. They'd forsaken his dead son. They can't take it back. They can't make it right. They betrayed him on his deathbed. He'll worry for the rest of his days that they're not loyal to him. He'll be paranoid for the rest of his days. These people are just waiting for the right opportunity to remove him from his throne. And he's not really wrong. You know, uh, a lot of them were. Also in 1553, Richard Chancellor, English explorer and navigator, becomes the first Englishman to penetrate the White Sea and establish relations with this new Tsardom of Russia. Ivan was pleased to open sea trading routes with England and other countries, as Muscovy did not yet have a connection with the Baltic Sea. That entire area was contested by neighboring powers of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Swedish Empire. Chancellor was happy to find a good new market for English wool, for receiving furs and other Muscovian goods. Ivan gives Chancellor letters to take back to England to invite more English traders to make the trip to Moscow. Because of this new relationship in 1555, the Muscovy Trading Company, also known as the Russian Company, is established. It was an English company, the first major chartered joint stock company, the precursor to the type of business that would soon flourish in England and finance exploration and colonization of the world by England. The Muscovy Company had a monopoly on trade between England and Muscovy all the way until 1698, and then it survived as a trading company all the way until the Russian Revolution of 1917. Ivan's, you know, he's making all kinds of power moves. He's making most of these moves without consulting the church or the boyars, which was new. Previous princes of Moscow had been uh, seen as more powerful than the boyars, but not by a lot. They were viewed as the most powerful noble, uh, but still a noble. But Ivan the Fourth, Ivan the Terrible, he's something new. He's his own class. He's a czar, an emperor. He's going to rule as he sees fit. He was religious, but he felt the church had no business interfering in the affairs of the state. He wrote stuff like, Remember when God delivered the Jews from slavery? Did he place above them a priest or many rulers? No. He placed above them a single czar, Moses. I love how he calls Moses a czar. Right, he's linking himself to, the, to Moses here. While the affairs of the priesthood he ordered should be conducted not by him, but by his brother Aaron, forbidding Aaron to be occupied with worldly matters. 
But when Aaron occupied himself with worldly affairs, he drew the people away from God. Do you see that it is not fitting for priests to do the work of czars? Also, when Dathan and Abirin wanted to seize power, remember how they were punished for this by their destruction, to which destruction they led many sons of Israel. You boyars are worthy of the same. This all reads as just do what I fucking tell you. I'm in charge. And the church, for the most part, they didn't mind this too much because, you know, as Russia grew more powerful, so did, so did their church. As mosques were converted into Orthodox chapels and various people forced to convert to the Russian Orthodox religion, the boyars, they didn't love it. They didn't love it. But as long as they get to keep their land and profit off new business ventures like the Moscovy Trading Company, right, and this new relationship with England, they were happy enough for the time being to do what they were told and just enjoy being rich. Uh, the boyars uh, really didn't like it that when Ivan revoked a major privilege they'd enjoyed for centuries a short time later, a major freedom the boyars lost under Ivan was the option to pledge allegiance to another prince. We mentioned that earlier. Prior to Ivan, right, they theoretically were free to join other princes, right? There was various princes in all these little towns and communities around Moscow. And if they're like, this guy was an asshole, they'd be like, okay, we're not supporting you anymore. We're going to go support Bob over here. Or whatever his name was. No, but then Ivan takes that power away. Now also, uh, the lands that they hold, they only hold on the condition that they serve the czar. Otherwise, they lose those lands, right? He demands loyalty in a new way from the uh, nobility that no Russian leader had demanded before. You are loyal to me only. If you are no longer loyal to me and you pledge allegiance to another uh, you know, prince somewhere else, you forfeit everything you own. Uh, also, uh, he uh, goes after the the serfs a little harder. They became increasingly chained to the land they worked on. From 1550 to 1650, Ivan and his successors would gradually insurf uh, the, the peasants more and more to the lands they farmed in order to prevent them from simply disappearing into the woods. So he's not just taking away privileges from the nobles, he's also taking it away from the peasants. Peasants are not technically slaves, but new laws bonded them further and further to their to the lands that they worked on. Because prior to this, prior to Ivan, you know, like if they were having, kind of like if a, if a noble was having trouble with the prince, he could go to another prince. And also if a peasant was having trouble with a noble, he could go farm and work for another noble. Not anymore. That's, nope, that's the land you, you stay on. Uh, Ivan would soon change the inability of Russian peasants to move up the social ladder in a, in a drastic way by turning thousands of them into his own private super loyal army and letting them become Russia's new nobles. That's something we'll deal with here soon. So he takes away some of the rights, but then a couple years down the road, he's going to give uh, some of the peasants uh, a big opportunity to, to move up and become the new nobility. He does, it's just, his rule is so schizophrenic. He has so many different things. Then he, cha- he goes back on what he did before. He, he makes reforms and he takes them away. On 1556, Ivan an- annexes the Khanate of Astrakhan after waging war against this additional Tatar enclave for two years. Uh, to seal this victory, Ivan has, Ivan has the Khan set on fire. Uh, just some more cruelty here. Then a bunch of his men piss on this guy to put the fire out. Then he has his still alive, burned, pissed on body, lashed several times with a spike whip or spiked whip. Then has him tossed into a barrel of salt. Has him stay in that barrel for three days. Then he has the barrel set on fire and rolled into a river. The guy's still alive. River puts out the fire. He's still alive to get him out of the barrel. Then he has this poor bastard shot out of a cannon into a pool of acid. Then he has soldiers quickly pour milk on this guy to neutralize the acid. He's still alive. Then this guy is buried up to his neck in the dirt. And Ivan has all the hair shaved off his head. And then he has fish from the river glued to his head with pine sap. Then Ivan's dogs aggressively eat the fish off his head, which was, I guess, pretty unpleasant. He's dug up, then forced to sit down on a chair made out of knives. Forced to play a chess match with Ivan. Every time he whimpers, he's whipped. Every time he loses a chess piece, uh, he has a square foot of his skin flayed off and a hot coal shoved up his ass. Then, still alive, they let him go and he lives for another 20 years and becomes one of Ivan's most trusted advisors because Ivan was very impressed how he was able to play chess pretty well under that, uh, under that type of duress. And that was horseshit. That was too much. I just needed to get that out of my system for some reason. There's so much over-the-top violence. I uh, know the Khan fled and lived, actually. His name was Dervish Ali Astrakhani. But he, he took this guy's city, took this guy's empire. And, and Ali's defeat was another huge victory for Ivan. So God is on his side. So, you know, despite passing a lot of legislation that doesn't sit well with people, he is expanding the empire. He's getting more lands. People do like that. Defeating this Khanate made the entire Volga a Russian river and gave Muscovy complete control of the important trade route to the Caspian Sea, which lay roughly 800, 1,800 kilometers, uh, over 1,100 miles to the southwest. 
The very next year, 1557, some sources say 1558, Ivan gave the wealthy Stroganov merchant family permission to colonize the East, paving the way for future Russian subjugation of Siberia. Uh, and yes, their name is Stroganov, as in Beef Stroganov. So delicious. Thank you, Russia, for Beef Stroganov. I love it. Uh, it's actually believed this very Russian dish was named after some of these people's descendants. Uh, the Stroganovs were the richest businessmen in the Tsardom of Russia, and a couple decades later, they would finance the actual conquest of Siberia. 1558, Ivan launches the Livonian War in an attempt to gain access to the Baltic Sea to the Northeast and its major trade routes, which would open up Russia to the British Empire, Spain, Portugal, the New World of the Americas, and more. I mean, yes, they were already trading uh, you know, with the British Empire, but this would make it that much easier to get goods back and forth. Uh, his campaign against the Livonian Catholic Knights would last for 25 years, and it would not go well. This war got way bigger than Ivan anticipated. When old Livonia collapses early into the uh, fighting and is divided between Denmark, Sweden, and Poland, Lithuania, and those three kingdoms are now fighting for land. So now instead of fighting one nation, Ivan is caught up in a war with several powerful nations that he hadn't intended fighting just yet. Damn Eastern European geography. There's always too many fucking kingdoms to conquer and subjugate over there. Having flashbacks again in the Vlad the Impaler suck. This is why when I play Risk, not even kidding, I don't dick around with Europe. A little, little bit of risk advice. Fuck Europe. Right? No, thank you. Sure, the five army territory bonus is enticing, but at what price? I never make a play uh, for Europe with risk. I just try to keep its borders weak so somebody else doesn't get that bonus. You know, geographically, it just has too many access points, too many borders to defend. Way easier to go for the Americas, maybe try to hold on to Australia. You know, so much of what various rulers have been able to do as far as empire expansion you know, has just been based on where the kingdom they were born into just happens to be located. Eastern Europe, a lot of countries are landlocked. The lands are rough, especially in the north, full of mountainous country, the Carpathian Mountains, the Transylvanian Alps, the Earl Mountains, the Caucasus, lands of savage winters. Plus, you start dicking around to the east too much. Now you have Mongols or Ottomans or whoever attacking you from the vast expanses of the west. Ivan was born into a tough spot to take over the world. And he finds out during the Livonian War that accomplishing a third Rome is going to be quite the challenge. Two years later, on August 7th, 1560, tragedy strikes Ivan. His beloved wife, Anastasia, dies. Modern scientific research has confirmed she was poisoned. Likely poisoned by boyars who wanted to kill her so that a daughter from their family could become the Tsar's next wife and produce possibly an heir to the throne connecting their family to the throne. These scheming bastards. Ivan knew her death was no accident. He knew the boyars were responsible. Now he begins to really earn his terrible nickname. One historian wrote of this point in Ivan's life that if Tsar Ivan had died in 1560, before the period of his terrible cruelties, he may have well have gone down in history as one of the greatest of the Orthodox kings. His tragedy was that he lived too long. Uh, before we get to his atrocities, Ivan does do another good thing in 1561. He has construction of the Cathedral of St. Basil, the Blessed, finished. The same year, he also marries his second wife, Maria Temra Nova, uh, Temri, <laughs> Tem, Temriyuanova, Yuv, no, Temriyuvna, uh, with the church's blessing. St. Basil's Cathedral was built with eight independent churches, again, encircling a larger central temple, each church consecrated in honor of important events in Russian spiritual or political life. And it is a beautiful building. Uh, the church also commemorates Ivan's victories over the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates. St. Basil's Cathedral completed on July 12th. Two years later, in 1563, Moscow's Metropolitan Markarius dies. Markarius, the man who had mentored Ivan when it came to religion, the man who sold him on the idea of a third Rome, and with Markarius dead, Ivan no longer cares nearly as much as he did before about having the church's blessing. The same year, Ivan beats one of his soldiers to death in a moment of impulsive anger, the first murder he's known to have committed with his own hands. Then the following year, on April 30th, 1564, Ivan's best general, a boyar named Andre Kurbsky, defects to the Lithuanians in the Livonian War. And this seems to be the straw that broke Ivan's mind. He feels deeply betrayed. And now shit gets real weird in New Russia. This is my favorite part of the suck. Uh, what happens next here, right? His, his beloved first wife dies. His religious mentor dies. His favorite general, most effective general, uh, you know, uh, sneaks off and, and joins the opposition, betrays him. And Ivan now kind of has a little bit of a breakdown. He shocks his boyars by announcing that he's going to abdicate the throne. In the final months of 1564, Ivan IV of Russia announces his intention to abdicate. He bounces out of Moscow with a bunch of treasure, a lot of soldiers, 
and a few boyars he trusted. They all head over to Alexandrovsk on December 3rd, a small but fortified town to the north where Ivan isolates himself. And then he writes two letters to Moscow after a month of radio silence. So first he just leaves and doesn't say shit for a whole month. And no one hits him up, you know, because, you know, he's, he might kill him. In the first letter, he attacks the boyars, accusing them of treason and embezzling state funds. He also attacks the church for siding with corrupt boyars and basically always being out to get him right after his religious mentor dies. Now he's not that into the church. In the second letter, he reassures the people of Muscovy that he still cares for them. This, this puts the boyars back in Moscow in a very uncomfortable position. Ivan may have not been overly popular with them. Numerous rebellions have been plotted. His first wife had been poisoned. But without him ruling a czar, a struggle for power would be inevitable. And a civil war would be probable. And if a civil war broke out, word would get out that Muscovy was leaderless. And who knows might attack them and reverse the territorial gains Ivan had made. Right? Because they don't want that. They don't want a civil war to break out. And now, you know, new Mongols come in and just fucking subjugate them all over again. And could make life even worse for them than it would be under Ivan, you know, poss possibly. They're also still in the midst of that cursed Livonian war. So not a good time to have the leader abandon them. And then Ivan is asked, probably begged is the better word, to please come back. Please come back and run shit again. And he agrees, but only if certain insane demands are met. This is where shit gets super, super weird. Ivan says he will come back only if he's allowed to, to create Oprichnina. Op a territory within Muscovy governed solely and absolutely by him. Yes, he was already czar, but he still had to meet with advisory councils and religious leaders who weighed in on decisions. He still had to consider their advice. There were still some limits to his powers, right? He sometimes had to get their approval in various matters. And now he was like, fuck that. Within Aprichnina, he would get to literally do whatever he wanted to do. He wanted God powers. If he felt like killing you, you died, no questions asked. If he felt like taking your land, he just got to take it. No one from the church, no one from the boyer class got to say shit about it to him. And he got to take the church's land if he wanted. He got to take the boyer's. He got to do whatever he wanted in this new land. He wanted the power to deal with whoever he considered a traitor, however he wished. The boyers, of course, do not like this idea. But they're faced with this or civil war and everything I mentioned earlier. So reluctantly, they agree to Ivan's demands. <laughs> And Ivan then returns and divides his country into two parts. He has like a country within a country. He has the Oprichnina and the Zemshnina. Zemsh, uh, Zemshin, Zemshina. Oh my God. The Zemshina would run uh, as Muscovy had ran prior to this experiment. It would run the same way. Uh, estimates vary, but they think between a third and half of Muscovy became Oprichnina. Situated mainly in the north, uh, the borders of this land were a little bit confusing to say the least. Ivan did shit like he would take an entire town to be part of his new thing, but not the surrounding countryside. The town would be his, but the rest would be Zemshnina, which again continued to operate under the existing governmental and legal institutions, a land ruled by a grand prince who was just a puppet leader of Ivan's. Moscow was carved up street by street, sometimes even building by building. On the same block, one building could be part of Oprichnina, and another building could be part of Zemshnina. So it's insane. This would be like if Trump or whoever our president is, when you're listening to this, whoever the leader is, if you know, what, whatever, uh, decided to take the southern states as his own personal nation, but also still got to rule the rest of the country through a pup puppet government as he was running it before, right? And then made San Francisco and uh, Silicon Valley and Seattle and Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks and Aspen, Colorado, part of the new private nation attached, you know, uh, to the south, but not geographically. And uh, maybe downtown Denver, but not the suburbs would be aligned with the new nation. Maybe Coeur d'Alene's resort, but not the rest of the town will be in the new nation. Uh, Sears Tower and Grant Park would be part of the new nation, but not the rest of the Chicago area. You know, it's, it's insane. And some do think he literally did this because he was actually crazy. Uh, others think he did this because if he asked to have all of Muscovy to do with whatever he wished, the Boyards would have said no. So he instead asked for this. It was a crazy ask, but one he thought he could get. <laughs> Some think he did this just to get the bargaining power he would need to hopefully soon rule all of Muscovy absolutely like this. Uh, the creation of the Oprichnina worked out pretty well for a dude who craved power, absolute power, and wanted to destroy the boyars. In his new land, once he carved out what he wanted, he just started kicking out boyars left and right, just taking everything from them. And there wasn't anything they could do about it. Uh, they would either get murdered, often tortured first, or they would be exiled and free to live in Zemshnina as nobles, uh, nobles who didn't have any land and money anymore. So good luck with that. And again, nothing they could do about this. 
<laughs> and then Ivan would give a lot of this new land and a lot of the treasure to members of his new personal army built out of the peasant class. So I mentioned earlier that he was going to like elevate some peasants up into nobles. This is how he did this. Uh, he had this new army built out of the peasant class, the Oprichniki, originally an army of a thousand dudes. These loyal, super loyal members of most of the lower classes were charged with kicking out boyars, also with sniffing out anyone who wasn't extremely loyal to Ivan. And they were given carte blanche to do whatever they wanted to so-called trade, really just to do whatever they wanted in general. The Oprichniki, the children of darkness, were the law in this new crazy land of Oprichnina and also above the law. The Oprichniki were soldiers, also ministers and judges and tax collectors and bureaucrats, each member carefully selected and screened for unwavering loyalty to, czar, to the czar, mainly selected from the military. Those who passed interrogations were rewarded with some land, you know, so, some, some, some of the, so, like whatever land they took, whatever payments they took, they could keep some for themselves. Ivan had a new special army of men who were both totally devoted to him and absolutely ruthless. The numbers of the Oprichniki grew from 1,000 to 6,000 between, uh, between 1565 and 1572. It even included some foreigners, uh, mainly mercenaries. Uh, many historians cite these Oprichniks as the original Russian secret police, the men who created the template for later Russian interrogators like the KGB. Not actually a ton of historical documents laying out exactly what the Oprichniki's roles were. Uh, often described in semi-mythical terms. They supposedly dressed in black robes, rode black horses, or sat in black carriages behind those black horses. They were like ring wraiths, straight out of the uh, Lord of the Rings. They used the broom and the dog's head as their symbols, one representing the sweeping away of traitors, the other the snapping at the heels of their enemies. It's possible, written in some sources, that some upper sneaks carried actual brooms and severed dog's heads around with them. That would be quite a sight. Some dude in a black robe rolling up outside your front door on a black horse carrying a broom and a fucking dog's head. Th that guy never brings you good news. That guy never brings you cookies, never stops by to tell you happy birthday or that your yard looks nice. That guy only brings death and pain and despair. Uh, answerable only to Ivan and uh, his you know, commanders, these opera sneaks created a climate of fear and murder. They could kill anyone they wished and they did. Their main mission was to terrify the local population into complete obedience into don't ever question our godlike leader Ivan submission. And they did that job very well. The stories associated with the deeds of the upper sneaks, you know, we mentioned them earlier, range from the grotesque and the outlandish to the equally grotesque and factual. People were whipped, impaled, mutilated on a regular basis. Torture and rape was common. The mythical upper Chnichi palace featured in many of the tales. Ivan built them a torture headquarters in Moscow. Their dungeons were supposedly full of prisoners at all times, of which at least 20 were tortured to death every day often supposedly in front of a laughing czar. He just like to, you know, sneak over to their dungeon, you know, head down there and watch the show sometimes. Uh, some of this actually is documented. Some of, some of it is not. Kind of like with last week's super killer, Alexander Solonik, hard to know where truth ends and propaganda, myth, and slander begin sometimes. Historians still bicker over many of the details regarding Ivan and the opera sneaky today. Some of what was written was written by people who hated Ivan and had access to grind. Some of what was written was written by those preposterously obedient to Ivan who wrote with a bias of fear. Anything they wrote that Ivan didn't like could literally get them killed. And some of it was written by Ivan himself, a narcissistic sociopath allergic to projecting any air of weakness. And on and on, you get the idea. But the Oprichniki torture palace was real. And a lot of terrible shit really did happen there, like so much rape. At this palace, their commander, right, Darth Vader, Melyuta Skuratov, liked to round up married women from all around Moscow, the noble class, and watch them be raped by various soldiers for his amusement. Uh, and there was a strategic reason for all of this. It was to fuck up noble bloodlines and leave nobles not knowing if their children were actually their children or Oprichniki rape children. This, these dudes were fucking savage. Uh, these maniacs, as we discussed earlier, who uh, in 1570, they attacked the city of Novgorod, you know, where the, the czar was believed with, they were planning to ally with Lithuania in the still going on uh, Livonian War. Uh, using forged documents as a pretext, right? Thousands were hanged, drowned, maimed, raped, deported. Uh, and that, you know, oh my God, in that real life purge movie, uh, there was a similar but less brutal sacking of uh, Pseskov following Novgorod. There was also the execution of a ton of Zemsnicha officials in Moscow. The Aprosniki even infiltrated the Russian Orthodox Church. The Tsar endowed a new monastic order and his brothers uh, came from the Aprosniki. So he's even like, you know, filling the, uh, <laughs> the church with Oprichniki members. 
a man named Prince Kerbsky who fled Muscovy in 1564 spread tales of these psychopaths to the rest of Europe, describing them as children of darkness, hundreds and thousands of times worse than hangmen. Uh, okay, before we continue, uh, one more quick sponsor. Uh, today's Time Suck is brought to you by the Super Killers Black Belts and Machine Guns Self Offense Classes. Hello, comrade. It is I, Sasha Alexander Solonik. I rebrand business with cooler name. I not teach self defense, I teach self offense. You never know when children of darkness be back for more rape and torture killing. You need protect self before you get skin flayed. I teach neck break karate chop. I teach decapitate kick. I teach shoot darkness kids off black horses so fast. And limited time, I teach cool tough guy lines like, do you know what time it is? My watch say, bullet o'clock! <laughs> JK, I not even have watch. Sign up today, don't delay, kill everyone in way. Time Suck is not responsible for any murder charges and litigation that may follow from killing everyone in way. Uh, sorry about that. It just seemed like a good spot for a, uh, for a self-defense or you know, self-offense class sponsor. Uh, now let's wrap up the era of the children of darkness. Eventually, like most organizations that rule through terror, the upper sneaky began to cannibalize themselves and fall apart. Internal quarrels, rivalries led many upper sneaky leaders to accuse themselves or accuse each other, excuse me, treason. That'd be weird to have them accuse themselves of treason. I, I treasoned. I did it. Torture me. Now, they accuse each other of treason. Uh, increasing numbers of Zemshni, Zemshnina. I fucking hate that word so much. Uh, officials were drafted in as replacements. Then in 1571, this new horrible experiment uh, comes to an end two years after Ivan's second wife dies. It's believed that Ivan himself had her poisoned. Uh, he definitely had a lot of people tortured and killed on suspicion that uh, they poisoned her. Uh, anyway, in 1571, some think after attacks on Novgorod and Peskov, Ivan may have been crazy enough to start purging Moscow too, but then another army beat him to the punch. In 1571, an army of Crimean Tatars, more Mongols, devastated the city, burning allegedly every single building but the Kremlin to the ground. <laughs> another fire, uh, enslaving tens of thousands of people. Man, this is a big fire too. So much for Ivan's new anti-fire codes. This is, this is big fire. This is fire number 10. 10th time. Moscow has burned in today's timeline in 333 years. This city burns off into the ground once every 33 years. It's the most flammable city of all time. And the people are pissed. Ivan hadn't properly prepared to defend the city. His Oprichnina spies had greatly misjudged how large of an army was coming for them. They told him it was just a few thousand dudes they could easily fight off. No, it was roughly 120,000 dudes. Whoops. After arriving in Moscow, the Khan's army set the suburbs on fire. And unfortunately for Moscow, it was a really windy day. Awesome for people who love kites. Terrible for people who hate burning alive. The wind blew the flames into Moscow and the city went up like it was made of kindling, which it probably was. Uh, according to Heinrich von Staden, a German Oprichnik in the service of Ivan the Terrible, the city, the palace, the Oprichnina palace, and the suburbs burned down completely in six hours. It was a great disaster because no one could escape. Uh, people fled in, into stone churches to try to escape the flames, only to have the stone churches collapse on them from the intensity of the fire around them and possibly from the pressure of the crowd squeezed inside them. People jumped into the Moscow River to escape. Lots of people. Lots of people drowned. The powder magazine of the Kremlin exploded. Those hiding in the cellar there were asphyxiated. When it was all over and the Khan's armies left the city, it was a marauding raid, not a takeover. Ivan ordered the dead found on the streets to be thrown into the river which a uh, uh, legend has it overflowed its banks and flooded parts of the town because of all the bodies. Sir Jerome Horstein, English explorer, diplomat, and politician of this era wrote, it took more than a year to clear away all the bodies. Not sure if that's true, but you get the idea. It was a huge bloodbath. One of the most savage fires in the history of Moscow, and obviously that is saying a lot. Historians estimate the number of casualties uh, of the fire from 60,000 to as many as over 200,000 people. For fuck's sake, I ask for a brick guy. For over a hundred years now, I'm so old and angry and tired of burning. Please, can we please get brick guy? Maybe cinder block guy. Anything but wood guy. Uh, Ivan would avoid the city for several years after the fire due to a lack of suitable habitation for him and his entourage. His capital was too burnt up for him to, to live there. Also, before they could rebuild again, Ivan grabbed as much treasure as he could and quickly bounced. Not a great look. Uh, they did rebuild again uh, with wood. <laughs> Kidding me? More wood. Okay, so I give up. Someone put me on the roof of new wood building and just set me on fire. 
uh, with the Oppertsnina, having clearly failed to defend the country and also a growing number of Oppertsniks implicated on various types of treachery, Ivan abolishes his private insane army of rude boys in 1572. Uh, the Tatar attack highlighted the damage that the Oppertsnina had done to Ivan's kingdom. The boyars were the political, economic, and social heart of Muscovy. And by undermining their power and resources, Ivan had destroyed much of the infrastructure of his country. Russia would never recover. Uh, well, you know, again, wouldn't recover for a long, long time. Uh, wouldn't become as strong as it had been after Ivan had destroyed these, those two khanates, but before he created the Oprichnina, not during his rule. Trade decreased. Divided military became ineffectual against other troops. Constant changes in government caused internal chaos. The skilled and peasant classes now began to leave Muscovy, driven out by rising taxes and, you know, constant murder. Some areas became so depopulated because people were fleeing that agriculture collapsed. The czar's external enemies began to exploit his uh, weaknesses. Turns out scaring the living shit out of your people and murdering and raping people year after year after year, not great for national morale. You know, when the opportunity is going to come up for people to bounce in a nation like that, they're going to bounce. Ivan became uh, more powerful internally through his opportunity, but now he ruled a much weaker nation. Communist dictator Joseph Stalin would later praise the opportunity for its role in damaging the boyar aristocracy and enforcing central government. Another good sign it was terrible when Stalin thought it was a great idea. Uh, Ivan would continue his descent into madness the rest of his reign, beginning in October, on October 28th, 1571. Ivan, now 41 years old, uh, gets married uh, to his, uh, it's going to be five wives in a span of nine years, starting with this marriage. Church not happy. He doesn't care. Some think he did this again because he was legitimately crazy. Others think there was some method to his madness. When he married one wife, he would promote her family to its uh, arbitrary new Russian aristocracy. Then when he chose another wife, he would replace the previous family with new aristocrats, uh, adding more chaos to the boyar class, you know, keeping uh, any of them from getting powerful enough to maybe attempt a coup or something. 1572, he has to deal with more Mongols. If it's not fire, it's Mongols. And sometimes both. Uh, the Tatars attack Moscow again. This time, they do get their asses whooped by a new army. He's back, baby. Lost his mind for a bit with his children of darkness murder police, but now he's kind of back to being a decent ruler, maybe, for a little tiny bit. Uh, Ivan's army beats the Khan's army in the Battle of Molodai. The Battle of Molodai, one of Ivan's most important battles. Definitely his greatest victory during the post-crazy murder police period of his rule. It was fought near the village of Molodai, 40 miles slash 64 kilometers south of Moscow. The Khan's military consisted of between 40,000 and 60,000 dudes equipped with cannons, outnumbering Ivan's 23,000 to 25,000 man defensive force. The Russians had prepared for the invasion. Their intelligence was more reliable this time. They set up fortifications just beyond the Oka River. And then the armies clashed on July 30th and fought for several days. The battle reaches peak on August 8th. The Russians constantly charging the Tatars, uh, you know, rendered their famed archery ability almost useless in the battle. The battle was fought primarily with swords and spears, which is crazy to me. Nine days of sword and spear fighting. How exhausted were the survivors of this battle when it was over? After the battle, only 20,000 Tatar horsemen returned to Crimea when the Khan left his tent, uh, while the Khan, excuse me, left his tent and banner on the battlefield and barely managed to escape with his own life. Several of his sons died in the battle, also one of his grandsons. So Ivan's reputation as a solid, not so crazy leader is somewhat restored here. And then the next few years are fairly quiet with Ivan focused mostly on getting married a bunch of times and killing at least one wife, like we talked about a while back. Then in 1577, the Stroganovs, ah, oh, some beef Stroganovs sounds so good right now. Stroganovs gain some territory in Siberia and add to Ivan's kingdom. They pay a Cossack leader, Yermak Timoveyevich, to protect Russian lands from attacks of the Siberian Khan, Kuchum, more Mongols. In 1580, this uh, Yermak fella conquers a good chunk of Siberia on behalf of the Russians who hired him. With only 540 Cossack warriors, he, he penetrates territories belonging to Khan uh, of Kuchum. Kuchum Khan. <laughs> Sounds like a made-up thing. Yermak pressures and persuades various tribes in the area to change their loyalties and become tributaries of Russia. Some agree. Yermak forces others. He establishes distant forts in, this new, in these newly conquered lands. Yermak's campaign, campaign is so successful and the Cossacks managed to, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the Cossacks managed to defeat the Siberian army in the Battle of Chufash Cape. And now Yermak needs reinforcements. He's doing great. Just give him some more dudes and he'll take over more Siberia. He sends an envoy to Ivan the Terrible with a message that proclaims Yermak conquered, uh, you know, Yermak conquered Siberia to be part of Russia. Ivan agrees to reinforce the Cossacks, but the detachment he sends to Siberia dies of starvation before it can make it to him. Damn it. It's tough to send troops out before they had trains, especially in Siberia, not a forgiving land. 
Uh, the Cossacks are then defeated. Yermak dies. Two years after Ivan's death, though, in 1586, the Russians do manage to gain a permanent foothold in Siberia by founding the city of uh, uh, Tumen, a city we talked about a lot in last week's Super Killer Suck, where Solonik, you know, uh, killed some guys. So the last big achievement of Ivan the Terrible was the conquering of Siberia for Russia. It happened to begin on his watch. Now for maybe the worst thing Ivan did. November 9th, 1581, right? Talked about that earlier. That's when some think Ivan killed his son, Ivan Jr., uh, heir to his throne. Did he really bash his son's head in with a cane when his son yelled at him for roughing up his son's wife to the point she miscarried? Maybe, maybe not. 1963, the corpses of Ivan the Terrible and his sons Ivan and Fyodor were temporarily exhumed. The bones of Ivan and his son Ivan contain high levels of mercury, comparable to the high levels of mercury found in the bones of Ivan's first wife when her remains were exhumed three decades later. And the research seemed to suggest that Ivan's the Terrible son was most likely poisoned, as was Ivan. Also, Ivan the Terrible was preparing Ivan, uh, you know, his son for Tsardom, making him a military commander, summoning him to discuss state affairs. So it was unlikely that Ivan would kill his heir, given the disastrous consequences it would bring, a dynastic crisis. However, uh, mercury, the analysis, the, the mercury analysis doesn't guarantee that Ivan was poisoned. And there is the thought that his dad truly was crazy. And crazy people do crazy shit sometimes, like bash their son's head in. So I guess believe what you want to believe. Regardless of how his eldest son died, the last few years of Ivan's reign, not good. The year his, Ivan, uh, the year his son Ivan died, uh, murdered by him or otherwise, Ivan formally asked the Pope to negotiate an end to his war with Poland, Lithuania. The Pope inter intervenes. The Livonian War finally ends over two, you know, uh, two years later, uh, 25 years after it began in 1583. Russia surrenders all of its gains in, made in this war with, uh, with its peace agreement. There is no definitive record of how many thousands of Russians died over the course of this war in numerous skirmishes, not mentioned in this timeline. So, you know, it finally ends and it was, yeah, just all for, all for nothing, essentially. March 18th, 1584, a year after that war ends, Ivan the Terrible finally dies at the age of 53. I say finally, even though he wasn't that old, just, he just, so much horrible shit. It seems like he was around forever. Uh, he's said to have died from a stroke while playing chess with a Russian statesman and close friend of his. Although it's also rumored that fed up boyers finally had had enough and they had somebody strangle him. Or he may have been poisoned, based again on exhumation uh, of his bones, you know, that I just mentioned, uh, that were found to have elevated levels of mercury. Uh, when he died, Boris was appointed as Lord Protector, Boris Godunov, I think I said it right. And the Russian throne was left to Ivan's highly unfit middle son, Fyodor. Fyodor was said to be a modest, shy, sickly, extremely pious kid, dude, spending hours in prayer and contemplation, nothing like his father, not a leader, uh, and uh, he'd also have no surviving children. And the Rurik dynasty, founded way back in 862 by Rurik that Viking, considered the first, uh, you know, really Russian leader, would end with Fyodor's death. And that will take us out of this time suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So, Ivan Vasilievich, Ivan IV. Ivan the Formidable, Ivan the Fearsome, Captain Poopy Pants, General Grumpy Gus, Lieutenant Looked the Other Way, Ivan the Terrible, guy who should have had a better fire department. Ivan Grozny uh, was indeed terrible. The, prophe the prophecy of the patriarch, Mark of Jerusalem, had come true. Uh, but he wasn't terrible the whole time. Before 1560, yeah, he did pretty good. Other than torturing small animals and, you know, feeding that one boyer to some dogs and maybe beating and raping a lot of, you know, peasants around Moscow and having bodies of women he raped dumped into the river. Or, or fed to dogs. Okay, uh, okay. He may have, he may, have, he may have always been terrible, but he did seem to deeply care for his first wife, and he did overhaul Russia in some good ways, like giving Russia a better legal code that he would later shit on with his fucking children of darkest psychopaths. Okay, he was mostly always terrible, but he did unify his nation like it hadn't been unified before. He did open up some new important trade routes. He did kick a lot of Mongol ass. He did oversee the beginning of Russian Siberian expansionism, which would greatly increase Russian territory. But again, mostly ter terrible. Rape, torture, gruesomely creative mass mur murder, you know, hooded psychos on black horses, huge parts of his legacy. Estimates put his death count uh, around at least uh, around 60,000 people, 60,000 of his own people that he had needlessly killed. He publicly admitted to having 3,750 people executed which isn't close to 60,000, but still seems like a lot. Uh, what I found interesting about this suck was how extremely sadistic and violent behavior, behavior that shocks us when it's committed by a modern-day serial killer like recent suck subject Bob Burdell of the Kansas City Butcher was just kind of status quo almost back in Ivan's time. 
Like he watched his mentor be skinned alive when he was growing up. He authorized the mass raping of nobles' wives to fuck up their bloodlines. He and his son gleefully pushed people who had been tied to slaves with their family members back into the ice of a frozen river. He had a pike shoved through a dude, a stake, then had his mom come talk to him as he slowly died on that stake before having her raped and beaten to death. And thanks to previous, you know, sucks on subjects like Vlad the Impaler and the Spanish Inquisition, this type of shit wasn't that atypical. Think Nimrod that today, for the most part, psychos like uh, Ivan the Terrible or Bob Rodella or Leonard Lake or Charles Ng from a few weeks ago are not even close to the norm. As much as we talk about dark people here on The Suck, way more good people, way more good people. Uh, COVID-19 sucks for sure, but uh, doesn't suck nearly as bad as living under the reign of Ivan the Terrible did. That was something I thought about during the research uh, for this. Thankful to be alive today, as weird as the times are right now. Oh, wouldn't trade them. Wouldn't trade them for these times. Whoa, still a great time to be alive. Uh, And time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Ivan's most famous nickname, the terrible, actually uh, initially meant as a compliment. It was mistranslated. And then ironically, the mistranslation suits him more than the original meaning of, you know, awesome or, or terrible to others ever did. Number two, 10 times Moscow burned, uh, usually the whole city to the ground 10 times in today's timeline. And we didn't even talk about the, uh, uh, another, uh, probably the most famous instance of Moscow burning because it happened after the timeline. In 1812, former suck subject Napoleon would also burn Moscow to the ground. His fire destroyed 75% of the city. Roughly 6,500 homes, 8,200 businesses, and 122 churches were destroyed. 12,000 citizens burned alive and a few hundred thousand displaced. So if you take a trip to Moscow, make sure the sprinkler system is uh, up to code at whatever hotel you're staying at. Number three, the upper Nina. Holy shit, the children of darkness. How weird was that period of history when those guys were just riding around on their black horses with their black robes, you know, just torturing, killing, raping, just whoever they pleased. Number four, Ivan may have came to his crazy mindset, honestly. Both his parents were dead by the time he was eight. His mom was murdered. The nobles put in charge of him hated him. Nobles who likely murdered his mom. When it came to nature versus nurture, he definitely got the shit end of the nurture stick. Uh, Number five, new info. In 2016, the Russian city of Oral inaugurated the country's first ever monument to Ivan the Terrible. And a lot of people weren't and aren't happy about it because of everything you learned today. The governor of Russia's Oral region, uh, you know, about 200 miles, 335 kilometers south of Moscow, backed the monument despite pushback, saying during its inauguration that Ivan the Terrible was, quote, a defender of our land, a czar who expanded its frontiers, uh, which is true. Uh, he didn't mention about, you know, the children of darkness or, or how he had one of his wives drowned for not being a virgin or how he pushed families into a frozen river. Uh, the monument, also backed by Russia's culture minister, who has argued that Ivan the Terrible's brutal rule is a myth and that his name was tarnished by Western travelers who slandered him in their writings. Man, Russian history, so hard to unravel. There is the official Russian version And then there is the rest of the world's version, oftentimes. And uh, these two versions are usually miles apart. Uh, The statue is another symbol dividing Russian society into those favoring Joseph Stalin-like strongmen rule and others decrying repression and authoritarianism. More than 500 people signed a local petition that said we don't need a monument to a tyrant in our city. Dmitry uh, Kryukin, an activist, said it showed Russian society's demand for a heavy hand for putting state needs several rungs above those of the individual. Man, the more I learn about Russia, the less I feel I understand it in many ways. And also the more I want to know. Such an interesting place. I am sure that we will be back soon. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Ivan the Terrible has been sucked. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope you did too. I like learning how it began with the Viking colony, later sacked by Mongols, later led by Moscow princes who uh, fought for independence. And I liked uh, learning how without Ivan the Terrible, there may have been no Russia as we know it today, right? He kicked off the czar phase of its history that turned it from just one of many Eastern European, you know, minor vassal states into an ambitious and very powerful empire. Uh, thank you to the Time Suck team, Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins, Reverend Doctor, Joe H.J. Paisley, Bit Elixir, Logan and Kate at Spicy Club running badmagicmerch.com, running the socials. Thanks to the script keeper, Zach Flannery. 
Uh, so much good info for this suck. Thanks to all those involved in keeping the cult of the curious private Facebook group a fun and irreverent and inviting and supportive place to virtually hang. Over 19,000 members in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. Uh, thanks to all the all-seeing eyes of the cult, helping the countess of the cult, Liz Hernandez, run that private Facebook group. Thanks to Liz for overseeing the Bojangles emails as well. Thanks to Beefsteak for keeping the Discord channel fun. Uh, you can access the Time Suck Discord channel via the Time Suck app available uh, in the Apple and Google Play stores. Over 6,000 members currently goofing around over on Discord. Also, thank you to the many time suckers who send gifts to the Suck Dungeon every week. Links for the online groups uh, and the address for the Suck Dungeon in the episode description. Uh, next week, we get uh, maybe darker. What the fuck's going on, Lucifina? Did you kill Nimrod and completely take over the Suck? Uh, the space lizards voted in the topic of killer kids. And the scriptkeeper tells me it is maybe the most interesting topic he has researched thus far. And I'll be spending three or four additional days on it to get it ready for you to hear next week. We're going to try to figure out why young killers have done what they've done. Now, is the answer in the, in, in the genes or in the environment? Nature versus nurture again. Uh, is there an agreed upon ratio of the two? What are the commonalities and the red flags these killer kids have, if any? What sort of mental and physical processes do these kids go through? Most importantly, what, if anything, can we do about it to prevent kids in the future from killing? Uh, we're going to look into everything from psychotropic drugs to violence and media to bad parenting, bullying, brain tumors, and more. And of course, we'll lay out numerous pretty chilling examples of kids who have, for whatever reason, chosen to kill. So Killer Kids next Monday. Now time for today's Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. Love this first update comes from a Russian-American sucker who questions the sources used for the Solonik suck. Top shelf Russian suck sack, Alexander G. writes, Greetings, Master Time Sucker, a.k.a. Lord of the Curious. I've been a fan of your comedy for years and two months ago discovered your podcast. I've been binging it ever since. I love the combination of interesting topics and your unique comedy style. It creates fun and very engaging content. Well, thank you. I was born in 1980 in the Soviet Union. Later in 2001, I immigrated to the U.S. where I currently live today. So you can imagine my excitement when I saw your last topic was about Solonik. I grew up during the wild 90s and remember his name always being in the news. Listening to you talk about those times brought back a lot of good memories and made me laugh about those crazy times. However, the source you used for the podcast is full of shit. There were so many made up and ridiculously exaggerated statements that I don't even know where to start. I do not claim to know everything about Solonik, but there are many books and articles written about his life in Russian. If only they could have been translated. Uh, one of them is a book by his lawyer and many articles based on the information released by the police. Here are some ex examples of what I'm talking about. According to those sources, Solonik was a below average student. And after eighth grade, he left school and got into a trade school. It got into a trade school. None of the sources mentioned him having a black belt in anything. Uh, he did do freestyle wrestling. At 18, he joined the army, served in Eastern Germany. He was never kicked out. In fact, he was honorably discharged and received a stellar recommendation. He, he, he used that to enter a police academy in Kurgan but was kicked out after six months under very mysterious circumstances. Then he worked as an undertaker where he met his future gangster friends. He was never in Oman because Oman did not exist until 1988. In 1987, he was arrested for rape, but managed to escape. However, was caught again two months later, was sent to prison. He managed, uh, no, he escaped in 1990. And only after that year, he began killing. I can go on and on, but I think you get the point. Anyways, I also wanted to say, I really enjoy listening to the episodes that deal with Russian history and your impressions of Russians are hilarious. In addition, I would like to humbly suggest a few topics for future episodes related to Russian history. Alexander uh, Su Suvorov, Cossacks. Oh, yeah, I mentioned them a little bit today. Uh, Spetsnaz GR GRU. Uh, hope you consider it. Thank you for all the great work that you do. Sincerely, a Soviet space lizard. Well, thank you, Soviet space lizard, Alexander. I mean, I love that you called this out. Uh, in fairness to me, I, I did say... <laughs> But I also thought the sources were possibly very full of shit and openly, openly mocked the best one I could find. Uh, I like her footnails, mother. Uh, I will say as far as Oman goes, the current version of Oman was formed in 1988. You are correct. But Oman morphed out of another police tactical unit formed in 1979, uh, according to numerous internet sources. Hard to tell with Google Translate if the previous group had the same acronym or not. So it may have been that he was part of the police group uh, group that later morphed into Oman, but not technically part of Oman. Uh, I do love that you heard uh, a lot about him growing up. The stories, uh, you know, in English about this guy make him seem uh, like just like this mythical character that's not even real. So hearing you say this 
you know, uh, adds to his tough guy legend to me. Uh, hopefully we can find more source information for all of our future Russian sucks. Yeah, that was the toughest one that we have done out of all the episodes to find any real info on out there on the web in English, at least. And again, you know, the source I used primarily was not in English. It was a, a book uh, originally written in Russia, translated into French, and then shittily translated uh, into English and, and possibly just fucking nonsense. But fun nonsense. Uh, okay, so curious what you thought of today's episode as well. Because uh, there definitely were, were or I guess, you know, are uh, conflicting sources regarding Ivan the Terrible. Okay, next up, Super Sucker Clifton Wright lets us know that some bad magic content has been the perfect pick-me-up for him recently. Clifton writes, Dan and Lindsay, the king and queen, I wanted to write in and let you guys know that between time suck and scared to death, y'all have kept me going. For medical reasons, I had to quit flying after 20 years and lost my sponsors to be in Red Bull Air Races. I'm now driving a truck and getting my master's. Sitting and living in this truck for a month at a time is horrible. I get dumber by the day. But listening to an intelligent, sarcastically funny podcast makes the miles and ass clowns on the road go by easy. I just went through Coeur d'Alene two days ago and love it. I've only ever flown over it before. Way different from my hometown in BFE, Tennessee. Please keep it up. So much dedication. It's an inspiration. Hail Nimrod. Well, thank you, Clifton, man. Good job getting a master's on your way to getting one. Damn, man, that's, that's, uh, that's a big deal. I'm jealous. I wish I would have studied a little longer myself in college. I should have taken some, some Latin, Latin. Jesus Christ. I wanted to say Latin classes to, to, would have helped me with my pronunciation abilities, and I didn't even say Latin right. Uh, but but oh, oh well, like, life has been working out. Glad we could keep you company on the road. Hope it keeps you alert too. Man, got to be careful, all you uh, long-haul driving suckers. That job takes a lot of concentrational endurance. Pretty sure concentrational is not a word, but it should be. I'm glad we keep you entertained. Hope we keep doing uh, doing that. Messages like you, uh, uh, the one you sent in, you know, messages from you, uh, motivate us. So hail Nimrod. Heavy and inspiring message now coming in from Kickass Meat Sack James M. James, I abbreviated your last name uh, due to the sensitivity of your message. James writes, Hi, Dan. My name is James. I'm writing to you about the Joseph Duncan podcast. I am the son of a very strong survivor of a horrific domestic sexual abuse. My mother was raped for 10 years straight by her own father. It has taken her over 30 years of therapy to be able to somewhat not have PTSD episodes and also to help her cope with multiple personality disorder. She somehow was able to eventually be able to forgive him. Sorry for rambling. Just wanted to thank you for giving your most honest opinion on how sick assholes like my mother's father should be rotting in jail. But now the only thing he has to worry about is registering as a level three sex offender. Anyway, I just want to say how much you have helped me understand that no matter how much pain someone can endure, it's not the end of the world, but can be the beginning of a beautiful new world with so much to look forward to. So thank you. Keep on sucking. P.S. Apologies for my long email, James. Well, not long at all. James, and thank you for sending your email in. And, and please give your strong, awesome mama a hug from us. Man, she's an inspiration. Good for her for sticking with therapy and, and raising a good son after all she went through. Uh, sorry your grandpa is a fucking asshole, a fucking dirtbag. Glad you feel the same. You know, you can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your blood. And most of us, we got a couple shitty branches in the tree that we have to do our best to uh, rise, abru- rise above. So hail Nimrod, James. Uh, super sucker, uh, Spencer Porter got scared recently. Why does that crack me up when, when you guys get scared by something I, I do? Uh, I'm a sick person. Here's what Spencer wrote. He wrote, uh, you and Lindsay almost made me fall off a boat. You jumpy motherfuckers. I listen to scared to death every week and I fucking love it. But a box fell off your shelf and you both shrieked like banshees in my ear holes. I was washing a boat at work and because it was super slippery and I had to grab, I had to grab a rail to save myself from flipping backwards off the side of the boat. The podcast lives up to the hype. Once my heart stops racing, I'll hit play again. Love you both. Keep up the spoopy and hail fucking Nimrod, your fan, Spencer. Well, thank you, Spencer. Yes, yes. Uh, the damn box falling uh, falling down in the Scared to Death studio was, was terrible this last week. I, uh, I may die during one of the Scared to Death future recordings. I watched a couple of horror movies alone uh, this, this last week because Lindsay can't do them anymore. And all the scary stories I've told and heard the past six plus months are starting to fuck my head up. Kept waiting for some horrible shit just to walk down the basement stairs behind me when I was watching these movies. Just sneak up on me. Thank, thank God Penny and Ginger watch these movies with me. But then sometimes they scare me because every time a, a dog or a horse shows up on the screen, Penny goes berserk and scares the shit out of me. Hey, Lucifina. Uh, glad you're enjoying one of our other shows. Now for some comedy. Not a Cummins law victim this time, but a good wackadoodle story. Uh, love these. Kick-ass sucker Fritz Russell updates a previous update of his, writing, Greetings, Suckmaster. 
At the end of the Baba Yaga suck, you played my message about my first experience with the real world wackadoodle, my own coworker. You also request that I keep you updated with more of his ramblings. Well, luckily for you, and slightly concerning for me, he and I are both considered essential workers, so I've been able to spend more time with him, racking up his theories and stories. The first one I remember is his birth certificate conspiracy. According to him, you are assigned a dollar value when you're born <laughs> because you are government property. This dollar value is stored in the U.S. Department of Treasury. According to my coworker, you can ask the Treasury to give you the value they assigned to you at birth, and they will. No questions asked. They just give you free money. <laughs> he supported this conspiracy by saying that every birth certificate is marked by the Treasury, and he has already received his money. I took one look at my own birth certificate when I got home to see that his statement about a marking was not true. Makes me wonder uh, what kind of money he actually received. The second story is about a weapon the U.S. military apparently has in its possession. It's a missile that has capabilities unlike any other missile. It can cloak itself in mid-flight. It is completely and utterly silent and capable of traveling faster than the speed of light. It's every mil <laughs> military leader's wet dream. Uh, but if this missile is so great, how come the U.S. has never used it, you may be asking? Well, here's the kicker. It was used constantly in the Vietnam War, but it has not seen use since. Now, I'm not in the military, so I cannot say if we really do have a missile of this magnitude or not. Uh, apparently, this wouldn't matter because my coworker told me that not even our military generals know this weapon exists. Only select few do, including him, for some reason, I guess. Finally, a waterproof theory of his. He once showed me a map that looked like a six-year-old had drawn it. It was a map of Florida, but with the water level risen by quite a bit. It was pretty much just a sliver of land. He told me it was projected that the water level around Florida would be what his map shown in, in by 2050. He then showed me a chart that also showed me that the life expectancy in 2050 would be only 60 years old. Then he told me that in, <laughs> that in 2050, there would also be uh, the appearance of a super moon. Uh, excuse me, a super moon. He asked me, do you see what all this means? I replied, no, I do not. And then he just didn't say anything. He didn't explain to me what it all meant. So uh, I don't know. I guess watch out for pesky supermoons, I guess. And I hope you enjoyed this lengthy read. I hope you have a, a blessed day. I did enjoy it, Fritz. This guy is a gem. Slap a salmon. Punch a bear. You fans of my stand-up, you'll, you'll, you'll get that one. You'll get that reference. Uh, this guy, man, pathological liar. What a wonderful, not real at all world he gets to live in. He just gets to build his own reality. I, I hope you get even crazier stories. I hope he shows you more maps. I hope he never uses one of those missiles on you. They sound intense as shit. And now let's end on a sweet shout out to one of last week's updates from Sweet Meat Sack, Rebecca Quick. Great name, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca writes, Dear Grandmaster of all of the suck and mushmouth evil Dan. <laughs> right from the start, I'm going to apologize for the length of my message. No need. I wanted to let, uh, I wanted to be able to thank one of the other time suckers, Danny Perillo. I have been a janitor at my job for a little over four and a quarter years and for the last month and a half have been isolated to the office area of my work because of the paranoia of one of the managers leaving me completely isolated from other coworkers, uh, kicking my depression into high gear. On top of that, my husband has been out of work for the last two months because of his work being shut down for the COVID-19 pandemic, and we aren't entirely sure when he'll be able to get back, which also kicks another one of my fears into high gear because I don't know if I can provide for my family long term. Having Danny give a shout out to the custodial janitorial staff was really something I needed to hear right now. Uh, I wanted to, to, a chance to thank him for it. Again, sorry for the length of my message. Sincerely, hopefully soon, space is Rebecca Quick. And again, no apologies necessary, Rebecca, and fuck COVID-19. Uh, that virus is a nasty little cunt, and I wish Ivan the Terrible could have one of his children of darkness tortured to death. Thank you for what you do, Rebecca. Man, so important. So sorry the pandemic has hit you especially hard. Hope your husband gets hired soon. You know, to, uh, to be able to go back to work and uh, hope you get the social socialization you need soon as well. Hope you're popping into the Facebook group sometimes for some extra hellos and laughs during this crazy period. And uh, thank you for sending that message. And thank all of you for sending the messages that don't always get read. Stay safe and hail Nimrod. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. New Scared to Death on Tuesday night. New Secret Suck this Thursday. Please keep your eyes peeled for the children of darkness that should be avoided at all costs. And keep on sucking. Oh my God, it's like the fifth time this place has burned down. 